Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rob Weiss, and I'm the 2021 chair of the IEEE USA Communications Committee. On behalf of the volunteers and staff of IEEE USA, we'd like to welcome you to the first EVO Conference virtual event, EVO on Campus 1.0. We've got some amazing sessions that will connect you with trailblazers in their field, focusing on technology trends, career guidance, and future perspectives. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Mercer, for this event along with all the other groups that have shown their amazing support. Without further ado, let us introduce you to our keynote, rocket scientist and woman in technology advocate, Natalie Panic. Hello, thank Hello. you. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to share some of my experiences today and some of the just really cool projects that I have been able to work on um, over the years as I've been pursuing one of my major dreams of becoming an astronaut. So I'm gonna share a couple of the major projects that I've worked on, some of my lessons learned along the way, and I'm gonna kick it all off by telling you a little bit about how it all began and some context. So I grew up on the west coast of Canada in the Canadian Rockies, where I spent almost every weekend um, from May long weekend to September camping with my family, with my two parents and my brothers. And they would load us up in their vehicle on a Friday afternoon after school. And we'd make a pro approximately two hour journey down southwest of the city that I grew up in to go camping for the weekend where we'd pick up our trailer. And we'd go out into the back country in the middle of nowhere where we had the freedom to just explore, to go hiking, to go fly fishing, to look at wildlife and just have awe and wonder and curiosity for the world around us. And that appreciation for adventure and for nature and the outdoors has stuck with me ever since. All um, um, through the past couple of decades as I've grown up and gone through my education and into my career. But what I really loved most about all of those weekends outside as a kid and as I grew up and outside now when I'm exploring are the opportunities to look up at the night sky. So when the sun sets and it gets dark enough outside and all of the stars come out to play and maybe you can catch a glimpse of the International Space Station going by or now Starlink or perhaps even an Iridium flare. And it was on those many, many nights out camping and stargazing as a kid that I realized I didn't want to just be exploring here on Earth, but I wanted to be exploring up there as well, traveling to space and going to remote places and exploring and learning and discovering and carrying that same awe and wonder and curiosity for the world that I grew up on, but in even further places. So I decided that I wanted to be the captain of my own starship, like the USS Enterprise. Um, but as I got a little bit older, I realized I probably wasn't going to be going to Starfleet Academy anytime soon, but maybe, just maybe one day, I could possibly travel to space by becoming an astronaut through an organization like the Canadian Space Agency or even NASA. Now, I'm sure some of you in the audience have similar aspirations 
And um, the thing about wanting to become an astronaut is there is no guidebook. There is no step-by-step -step instruction manual that tells you these are all the things you need to do. And if you do these things, you will become an astronaut. There are so many different paths that you can follow. There are so many different educational um, directions that you can pursue, careers that you can pursue. And it's just about trying to collect as many experiences as you can so that you might be in a good position to be the candidate that um, space agencies or organizations are looking for when they put out a call for astronauts. So my journey to becoming an astronaut and trying to figure out how to get there and how to achieve this goal brought me to where I am now, which is a company called MDA Space. And our work is all about space robotics, whether that is building robotic arms like Canada Arm or Canada Arm 2 or the Dexter robot that are on the International Space Station or building parts of Mars rovers or building instruments like LIDARs that are on spacecraft that are exploring astronauts. So really cool um, frontier-like innovative technologies that are pushing the boundaries of what we do in space. So that kind of sets you up for my motivations and where I am today. Now I'm going to talk about some of the uh, cool projects that have been a fundamental foundation in where I am today. And I want to kick that off talking about a solar powered car project that I joined when I was in university. So where I went to school on the west coast of Canada, the industry is primarily oil and gas. There aren't a lot of opportunities to pursue aerospace engineering. And so when I saw this team that was looking for engineering students to come out and help build a solar powered car where I could join an aerodynamic sub team and help design the shape of the car and the aerodynamics of the car, I thought it would be really great experience. And so the vehicle that we were building was to compete in something called the North American Solar Challenge or also the American Solar Challenge. And the year that we raced was the first time ever that it was finishing in Canada. So we were racing from Austin, Texas, across the border north to Winnipeg in Manitoba in Canada and then west over to Calgary, Alberta, Canada. So when the North American Solar Challenge approached our university about finish line for this race, the president of our university or college decided that we couldn't just have students waving a checkered flag at the finish line. We needed to actually build a car, test the car and compete the car in the race, which was a super awesome and exciting goal, except that we were a bit of an underdog in the competition because most universities that are competing in the race have already built these cars before. They've raced in a and one of these challenges before. So they have um, experience building solar powered vehicles. They know what they're doing. They have resources in place. They have mentors and they have funding to build the cars. And they also have uh, usually two years to build a new iteration of the vehicles. When we competed, we had never done this before. We had no clue what we were doing. We didn't have any money. We didn't really have any mentors to help us along. And we only had nine months to build our first ever solar powered vehicle, which is the one that you see on the screen. It's a spaceship looking really low profile to the ground at the time we were building them. Um, experimental test vehicle that's using energy from the sun, um, which gets converted into electricity to power a motor that's in the rear wheel of the car. And then all of the solar cells are the black tiles that you see on the top of the aero shell there, about the size of the piece of bread at the time. And so what I really loved about this project and why I'm talking about it today is because it was like a classroom outside the city limits. It was all about hands on experiential learning where we were failing and troubleshooting every single day. I don't think anything we did because we had no idea what we were doing ever went according to plan. It was all about trial and error, trying to apply what we had learned in class and working together as a team to overcome any obstacles or barriers that we faced on a daily basis for the nine months that we spent building this vehicle. And we spent um, that nine months of, of this process living and breathing the entire life cycle of an engineering project. So that upfront brainstorming, pencil to paper, anything goes phase where you're just coming up with what your design can look like moving into analysis and testing 
and simulations and proving that that concept that you came up with and moving into more detailed design is actually going to work. Is this concept or is this product feasible? And then once you've done that math, once you've crunched the numbers and you're pretty sure that your design is going to do what it needs to do, then you can start ordering your hardware and manufacturing and building and testing and bringing the product or the vehicle to life. And for the nine months that we did that, we learned the ins and outs of teamwork that um, the frustration that can often arise when success isn't immediate and when teams are overworked, but also the amazing feelings of success when you figure just the smallest thing out, like how to mount a solar cell to the top of a composite um, aero shell or how to design the chassis of a solar powered vehicle or how to um, even get a permit to drive one of these vehicles on the highway. It was about, as I mentioned, those daily trial and errors and just working together as a team to get to that next step. And then ultimately getting to a point where we could build our vehicle. This is what it looks like on the inside. So you see the chassis there, the skeleton of the car with the driver seated inside, two wheels at the front on either side, one wheel underneath the driver at the back with the motor in it, and then a battery box at the front. And that is where you can um, store um, the electricity from your solar cells if you don't have a great day outside to power uh, directly off of your solar cells. And then ultimately that got us down to Texas for the 10 day race from Austin back to Calgary. And I love showing this picture because not many people can say they cross the border between uh, two countries in an experimental test vehicle. And then 10 days later, we crossed the finish line into the University of Calgary campus with over 10,000 people that came out to see what group of university students could accomplish with not a lot of resources, but a whole lot of passion. And all that to say, it's awesome to be able to set big goals and to dream big. And you don't always need a lot of money or a lot of resources in order to achieve or make those goals happen. You just have to have passion and dedication and hard work and a willingness to keep going when you're faced with obstacles um, over and over again. So that project in university was really my first exposure to what it is like to work in industry, to work on big engineering projects. And I found it really exciting. I wanted more of that. And so after I graduated, I mentioned I ended up where I am now at MDA Space, working on all kinds of really cool space robotics projects. And our claim to fame is the original Canada Arm that flew on the space shuttle, as well as Canada Arm 2 that was instrumental in building the International Space Station and is still in service today for a variety of activities, whether it's capturing cargo vehicles or um, maneuvering astronauts around during extravehicular activities. And so one of the major projects that I've been able to work on at MDA in the last five years is a rover um, for the European Space Agency called the Rosalind Franklin ExoMars rover. Uh, this is the European Space Agency's first attempt at a Mars rover that is scheduled to launch next summer in 2022. Um, and its goal is to search for signs of life and our contribution on it. I can spin it around is the whole chassis and locomotion system for this rover so everything that this rover needs to be able to deploy once it lands on mars to be able to steer and to drive around to different locations to do its science so um, the chassis and locomotion system comprises six wheels three on either side the front two wheels on either side are connected through a pivot and that's called a bogey and then the rear two wheels on the rover are connected also through a pivot at so this is called a triple bogey suspension system. Each wheel has a motor or an actuator in the center, which is used for driving the rover forward or backwards. At the top of each leg is another set of motors, so another six motors that are used for steering, so that turns the rover right or left. And then just inside of each of those motors is another six set of motors called the deployment actuators or motors. So when we send something to another planet, it has to stow pretty compact because there isn't a lot of room in the fairing of the rocket. It wouldn't be able to travel to Mars in the state that you see on the screen now with all its solar cells deployed, with the mast cameras sitting up so high like that or so proud like that, and with the um, chassis and lo locomotion system fully deployed. So we have a set of actuators that get it from a really nice stowed compact configuration into the 
legs straight down to the ground, ready to drive and rip around on Mars configuration that you see there. So just for comparison, this rover that we're building, this ExoMars rover here, which is the second from the left, um, in comparison to Mars Exploration Rover far on the left and Mars 2020, and then a down the road rover called Sample Fetch. So we are um, kind of right in the middle of some of the older legacy rovers and uh, the last rover that landed on Mars from NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And then also for scale, a couple others, you see Spirit and Opportunity here, and then Curiosity is Mars Exploration Rover here on the right. So lots of the rovers that are exploring Mars are different sizes. They, they generally have the same number of wheels. And then one difference between the rovers that are already on Mars, so like MER, for example, or Mars 2020, is that they typically use a rocker bogey suspension system. So all three wheels on either side are connected through the same structure, the same chassis. And then each side of the rover is connected through a differential. Whereas our rover has, as I mentioned, a triple bogey suspension. Our rear wheels are not connected to our front two wheels at all. And the really interesting aspect of this program for me and one of my major takeaways was the importance of having a vision and making sure that every member of the team remembers that vision as you go and remembers why you are trying to do what you're trying to do. Aerospace engineering projects are very long. They are long duration programs. They could be five years, they could be 10 years, they could be 20 years, and they're hard. We are building things that have never been built before to work in, in extreme environments. And it requires a lot of creativity. It requires a lot of engineering and it requires a lot of testing to give ourselves that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that whatever we're building is actually gonna work when it gets to Mars. And oftentimes when you're working on these types of projects or even the solar car, for example, where things are challenging, um, it can often cause frustration in a team. And that's why the vision is so important to remind everybody what you're trying to accomplish. So for us, our reminder was just a simple phrase that we're going to Mars. We are going to Mars. We have an opportunity to work on a Mars rover that is actually exploring another planet. And just using that vision to have some optimism and to remember when you're faced with challenges or obstacles, as you're working through these challenging projects, that there's usually always a way forward. And you're, when you're working with a team of really bright and talented people, people coming together and brainstorming and troubleshooting is going to get you over those humps and as long as you're constantly reminding yourself what you want to achieve what that grand vision is you'll usually always find a way to get there so this is the actual flight version of the rover that's going to launch in 2022 in its deployed configuration that's a couple of the bogies just for interest in the airbus clean room in the uk um, a close-up shot of one of the wheels we've designed, which if you're a space buff or familiar with any of the other rovers will recognize it's quite different. Um, it's designed full of springs and it's a hexagonal shape. And then this is the stowed configuration of the rover that I was mentioning, where it all folds up nice and compact on itself. So you can see the solar cells at the top are all folded in, and then our legs are all folded in nice and tight and compact. And in this picture, the hardware is getting um, tested on a vibration table. So it's being subjected to the loads it would see during launch to make sure that nothing is going to fail when it uh, rides a rocket into space. And then more testing that's happening with the final design uh, of the rover. And of course, just a picture standing with our hardware because at the at the end of the day, when you've overcome all of those challenges and obstacles, it's just really rewarding to stand there and appreciate how far you've come and how much you've learned and uh, looking forward to what happens next for the equipment that you build and deliver. So from there, when I'm not working on the Mars rover project that I just talked about, I have spent a lot of time working on projects related to on-orbit satellite servicing. So this is all about trying to clean up the orbital environments around Earth. So this is an artist's rendition of all of the space junk that's orbiting Earth in different orbits, whether it's low Earth orbit or geosynchronous orbit, and this is obviously not to scale. It's just to give an idea of all the different sizes of debris that's up there and how much is up there. And when I say space junk, I'm talking about any human-made debris that could be spent rocket boosters, could be pieces of debris from previous satellite collisions, 
um, anything the size of a small paint fleck to the size of a tennis ball to the size of a screwdriver traveling around at hyper velocities and it can be super dangerous and space junk even includes entire satellites that are no longer working so if i'm here on earth and i'm driving a car around or i have appliances in my house if either of those things break down i can usually get them fixed and make them usable again if my car needs a tire rotation or i need to change my oil or there's something wrong with the engine i can try and fix it myself or take it to a mechanic that type of infrastructure doesn't exist in space for satellites i can't just call a space tow truck or an orbital mechanic and say hey come fix my broken down satellite or come refuel it if it's run out of propellant and so um some of the types of projects we work on at mda are trying to enable on orbit satellite servicing so using some sort of space tow truck like this silver one on the left that has robotic arms mounted on it to go and service a um, broken down satellite which an example of uh, is shown on the right. So this, the servicer spacecraft or the space tow truck would rendezvous and dock with a satellite that's broken down and either do repairs on it or transfer propellant. And um, so we've been trying to prove out the concepts of how to make on-orbit satellite servicing possible over the years. And we build a lot of prototypes and test beds in our facilities and our lab environments to prove out these concepts. When I first started at MDA, I had absolutely zero experience in robotics. I hadn't taken a robotics class in university. I didn't study robotics during my graduate studies. I had no work experience in robotics. I really don't think I had ever even taken a mechatronics class. So when I was hired into this job to help build these robotic arms to do on-orbit satellite servicing or on-orbit assembly operations, I immediately felt like a fish out of water. I felt like I didn't belong there or that I didn't have enough knowledge to be able to contribute to the team and I think that's often a feeling that many many young folks feel when starting a new job it's intimidating or you feel vulnerable or you feel out of place particularly um, if you don't have the requisite experience and you've been given a great opportunity but I, what I've learned over the years from this kind of project or for the Mars or from the Mars rover project that I talked about is that you put yourself in situations outside of your comfort zone so that you can surround yourself with people who can teach you things you do not know. And that is a really powerful position to be in. As long as you're constantly learning and constantly in opportunities to ask questions, um, that's a good place to be, even if you feel vulnerable or um, scared in the moment because you might not be able to contribute. Um, and then just a quick example of an on-orbit satellite assembly mission. Um, being uh, led by Maxar, which is to assemble the antenna re reflector of a communication satellite. So I talked a little bit about my projects. I started off today talking about how all of that was driven by a dream to become an astronaut. So where am I in that dream? Where am I in that pursuit of long day traveling to space? Well, the Canadian space program is pretty small. We haven't had very many astronauts over the years, and our astronaut recruitment campaigns are very few and far between. Uh, but back in 2016, the Canadian Space Agency did put out a new call for astronauts. They were hiring two new astronauts um, for their astronaut corps to join the existing two astronauts that we have already. And this is kind of just a representation of the percentage of people who applied across all our provinces and territories. There were nearly 4,000 applicants for just two positions. So obviously, I submit my application in this recruitment campaign a few years ago. I got very far in the process, all the way into the top 100, um, went for a very detailed medical examination with some military doctors, and then subsequently found out I had been eliminated from the recruitment because I have a streak of white hair that is caused by a skin disorder. So it doesn't impact my health at all right now. It really has no impact on my life. I've had the streak of white hair and the skin disorder since I was a kid, but unfortunately it was an automatic disqualifier. And I 
can't even explain how heartbreaking it was in that moment and how big a failure I felt that I had been working so long and so hard to a dream, to achieve a dream. And then it was suddenly taken away from me from something out of my control. And I often tell people that um, it, it's funny because the streak of white hair for most of my life felt like my superpower because everybody thought I looked like Rogue from the X-Men. And then all of a sudden it was like career kryptonite. It was keeping me from achieving this thing that I've wanted probably since the time that I got the streak of white hair. And in the many days and months that followed from that rejection, I spent a lot of time thinking about my life and my goals and what success means. And I wanna share a couple of my key takeaways as I process that rejection from the astronaut recruitment. The first is that it is absolutely, absolutely okay to set big goals and dreams and never achieve them. That is not a bad thing and there is no shame in that because usually what matters most is everything that you achieve along the way. Um, the second is that um, usually success or not usually, but for a lot of people, success does not have to be lateral. So we're taught that often success has to be this blue arrow, right? It's a straight line. You're climbing the ladder in your career, um, trying to get to that next promotion. Whereas success in my life has <laughs> seriously looked like the black line. So forwards, backwards, sideways, sometimes swirling down the toilet, trying to figure out what to do next, taking steps backward in order to go forward, and really just extending myself out in multiple spaces to find success. So um, really ha having fun and enjoyment in my job, but also doing a lot of outreach and trying to connect with young people and making time to pursue my other passions in the outdoors. And it's that lateral version of success that has really worked for me. And so that brings me to my last point that success does not look the same for everyone, nor should it. And we need to make sure that we are supporting everybody's versions of success as we navigate through our own careers and work with colleagues and become mentors and try and lift other people uh, up along the way. And so I will leave you today with just a, a final thoughts on as you're pursuing your education and your career, trying to keep in mind living a life of peak moments. And so when I say a peak moment, I mean a time in your life when you feel fully alive, where you feel like you have everything at your disposal to succeed and pursue your passion. And so one of the summers that I was pursuing grad studies, I got to attend a space studies program through the International Space University at NASA's Ames Research Center. And that was this really intensive program where we were um, doing coursework in anything and everything related to space exploration, whether it was space law and policy, space ethics, um, space life sciences, spacecraft design, orbital mechanics, whatever, um, touring aerospace companies, listening to panels, talking to aerospace engineers and scientists, and just like full on exposure in a short amount of time to the aerospace industry. And one of the three weekends we had in the summer, we decided we all wanted to go skydiving. So we drove out to Monterey, California, where you can do the world's highest tandem skydive. I think that's still the case anyway. So about a dozen of us piled into two vans, drove out to this hangar, um, got um, shuffled into a tiny room where we signed our lives away on the waiver and then moved out into this hangar that you see on the screen where our instructors because it was a tandem jump so they were jumping with us were packing up all of our parachutes and gear and uh kind of stood by watching them get everything ready to go ready to jump got paired up with our instructors that's the plane on the screen that we the, the plane on the screen is the plane that we jumped from. So after we got paired with our instructors, they got us in all our gear, got us all harnessed up, got into the plane, took off, flew up to altitude, and then the two guys in front of us jumped first. So they kind of shimmied their way to the open door, got ready to jump, and then threw themselves out of this open door of this perfectly working airplane. And then we were next in line, so me there with my instructor, we shuffled awkwardly to the open frame of the airplane. And then just momentarily before we jumped, I had this thought cross my mind that I was doing this program at a NASA center as a Canadian 
literally about to throw myself out of an airplane. And for me, that was one of my peak moments where I felt surrounded by all of these young people who really thought we could change the face of the aerospace industry. And I knew that this is the type of work I wanted. This is what I wanted to be doing. This was a peak moment for me. And I often reflect on peak moments in my life and, and take moments to just stop and think about where I am because often unexpected priorities arise or things happen in our lives that shift us away from our priorities or our goals or our passions. And reflecting on peak moments, again, those times where you feel full of life, where you have everything at your disposal to succeed, can help us recenter ourselves on our passions and help us um, readjust or reevaluate where we want to be going and what we want to be doing next and what are the next goals that uh, we want to set. So as you pursue next steps in your education, as you pursue whether continuing into academia or industry, remember that um, you want to be looking to, to live peak moments. Never be afraid of, of failure, of setbacks or roadblocks. There's usually always a way to overcome them and get to those next steps and be willing to put yourself outside of your comfort zone so that you're in a position to be constantly learning and growing and pushing yourselves and your limits as an individual. So thank you so much. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Paige Kaslin and I've been an IEEE member for um, almost 10 years now. I joined when I was an electrical engineering student in 2012. And I'm gonna facilitate this fireside chat. Um, but before doing that, Natalie, I just have to say, wow, that was such an inspiring keynote um, story. There were just so many messages and I can't wait to dive deep into all of those. Um, and just to provide some background, I think this is gonna be a really fun discussion because like you talked about, you started your career working with a solar powered car that traveled from the US and Canada. Um, and I started my career working on a solar powered airplane, Solar Impulse 2, nice. which flew around the world. Um, yeah, not, not too often you get two people that have started um, their careers with some of these solar mobility um, experimental technologies. So great to meet you. Likewise, thank you so much, Paige. So first off, um, you know, I loved how you talked about as a young girl, you looked up at the sky and thought, I want to be up there. And how do you think at that young age, you were able to find the confidence to do something that a lot of people would think is totally impossible for their career? Uh, good question. You know, I don't know if I ever, thought about it being impossible like I just I watched a lot of sci-fi growing up whether it was Star Trek or Stargate and seeing Samantha Carter and for me it just seemed like a normal thing to do um interestingly my parents aren't engineers like they don't have any experience in this area and when I first told them I wanted to be an astronaut I, th I think they didn't know what to do with it and like certainly didn't know how to help me get there, but um, they never doubted that I could do it and kind of just gave me the space I needed to pursue whatever I needed to do. And if I ran into obstacles or ran into roadblocks, just made sure that I kept going, not to dwell on that failure, but to keep moving forward. And I think that really was the support that I needed to make sure I had the confidence to keep pursuing this. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely amazing and great that you had that supportive family there cheering you on and saying you got this. Um, and I think then kind of transitioning to even your work with the solar car. So that was definitely a really influential project um, that really kickstarted your career. Um, and so I know a lot of times when people are juggling at university, their classes, and then also all these other projects, do you have any advice for how 
people could manage their time and how they can take advantage of some of these opportunities for projects? Yeah, so I mean, we all get it that we all get that struggle of trying to do your labs and your tutorials and your classes and study for exams, but also have fun and then pursue these extracurricular activities. It's definitely it's definitely challenging. But um, one thing I have learned through the experiences I have had are just how powerful those hands on where you get to physically touch things and make things activities are and how much more impact that has had on my engineering career. Like studying from your books is important and your grades are important, but I, I truly feel that hands-on experience has put me in such a more powerful position in my career, especially where I do a lot of systems engineering now. And so exposure to different disciplines and being able to talk to different engineering faculties is, is so key. And so it's about just trying to make sure that you you have time to focus on different things and finding a network of people who can also support you, people who you can study with, uh, people who you can lean on and rely on. Yeah, no, that's um, that's definitely great. And I think, you know, even as um, you talked about where having a vision is really one of the most important factors in a successful aerospace project, it really seems like, you know, not just specific to the project, but really for your whole life, it seems like having that vision of what you want to accomplish, um, you know, is the key ingredient. So do you have any advice for how someone can really solidify their vision and then plan those incremental steps to reach it? Uh, so I think that that incremental part that you mentioned is key, right? Like when I set that goal of wanting to become an astronaut, that was so far down the pipeline, right? Like it was such a huge dream and trying to fathom or think about how to get there in one shot, it was totally impossible. So it was about like looking up what other um, astronauts had pursued for school or what activities they had done. And so some had gone into engineering, some had got private pilot's licenses, some were scuba divers, like, just all of these little things that you can add to your resume to help build things up. And so I know your original question was about solidifying a vision, but I want to emphasize that if you have a vision, it doesn't have to be the vision that you stick with throughout your career and through your life. It is okay for your vision to um, change and to shift as you grow and meet new people and go through different phases of your education and career. It doesn't have to stay the same. Um, life is full of ebbs and flows and we're often tossed curveballs. And so it's, it's okay to have to pivot and change your vision if you need to. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's so interesting because all of your messages throughout the keynote and even what you're talking about now, I feel like we were saying, it aligns with that greater vision and being able to, you know, know what you're focusing on helps you get through those challenging moments. Um, so, you know, one of the challenging moments you mentioned was being that fish out of water on the robotics team. Um, and you talked about how important it was to be in those situations. I know a lot of times um, in engineering, right, we have an equation and we're comfortable using that. But do you have any tips for, um, you know, how people can get through those uncomfortable moments where they're not really sure where to turn. They're totally that fish out of water. A hundred percent relying on your team and the people around you. Like um, one of the great things I found at school on the solar powered car in my job is just the amount of knowledge and um, excitement of the people that we get to work with and being able to ask as many questions as you need to or being able to admit that you don't know something and you need help is a really big start so um yeah, oftentimes you'll just be surrounded by really great people that can help you get the information you need and help you feel less like a fish out of water, even if it's scary to admit that you don't know something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like another common theme, right, is this um, surrounding yourself with the right people. So I know you talked about that very difficult rejection from the astronaut program. And, you know, it's amazing that you still were able to have such a positive outlook and change that definition of success. Um, so did you have any mentors 
that were able to help you through that? And could you share any of the advice that they provided you that really stuck? Yeah, a great question. Um, I, I think the majority of the support I got wasn't from specific mentors, but it was actually from from my colleagues. I'm talking about my colleagues a lot, but they knew they knew how much that meant to me, and they knew how much I had been supporting it. And I, I think just trying to help keep me focused on the the type of work that I was still getting to do at MDA and keeping in mind the the game changing technologies that we get to develop and still have an impact um, and just not out, outright reminding me, but reminding me that being an astronaut isn't the only way to contribute and be a big deal in the aerospace industry. There's so many different things you can do, so many different avenues to pursue, and there's so many different disciplines and, and backgrounds that are required to make aerospace projects happen that are just as exciting as going to space. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, this is kind of a little bit of a pivot, but when you say space exploration, I know even from my experience with the solar powered airplane, so many people jump to the question, well, how much is that going to cost? Mm -hmm. So what would you say to those people that think space exploration might not be worth all of the money um, and that we should solve the problems on Earth first? Well, I, I mean, this is a pretty standard answer, but like almost everything are so many things that we develop for aerospace so many of the technologies that we come up with um, have spin-off technologies that really benefit benefit us here on earth and a lot of the work we do whether it's earth observation or satellite servicing is all about enhancing the way that we live and work and bringing positive change to our communities and so while it might be space exploration which seems really foreign it is all about um as I mentioned, creating positive change here on Earth, and it it indirectly feeds back. And I think um, us folks working in the aerospace industry need to um, need to to share why we love what we do and why it's important, and make that connection between the high tech that we're building and how it can really create a positive impact to someone who isn't directly involved in the space industry. Like we can talk about um, satellite servicing as a good example because. Satellites enable our daily lives, uh, either directly or indirectly. Our lives would look entirely different if we did not have satellites. So by us spending money on trying to clean up the orbital environment and trying to recycle satellites and, and make that space more sustainable, it is enabling everybody to keep living the lives that we live now and making them better day to day. Mm -hmm. And I know that you're also a huge woman in tech supporter and advocate. Um, so, you know, if you could provide any advice to any aspiring um, women in STEM or any women currently studying STEM and even any, you know, people that are in the STEM industry that could be the allies, um, any advice for them? And even why is it so important to have more women in STEM? Okay, I'm, kinda, I'm, I'm not going to directly answer all your questions, but I'm just going to kind of throw a bunch of things out there. So obviously, diversity, equity, and inclusion are important just fundamentally because it makes us do better business. It really um, impacts the bottom line just by having all of these different diverse perspectives working on innovative technologies. Um, changing how we live and work is gonna require so much thought and input from, from all of the people who are affected by the technology that we were building. So we can't build it in isolation. We need to tap into everybody, whether it's different age groups, genders, um, uh, backgrounds, whatever it may be. And so my advice isn't necessarily to the minorities who are pursuing these fields, it's to everybody else and that we need to make sure we are creating safe spaces where everybody feels like they can come and contribute and pursue their passions without having barriers that have no business being barriers. So that means being an ally. That means stopping and listening. That means not 
thinking that minorities need to shoulder all of the load for change. Change is on us. And I would ask that anytime you're in a room, anytime you're in a classroom, anytime you're in an office space, take a look around. And if everybody in that room looks like you, then something has to change. And by you taking a moment to stop and recognize who is in the room means that you have the power to make a change. You have the power to speak up and you have the power to make sure that we're making sure everybody's voices are heard. Yeah, no, that's definitely a very powerful message and something really we all have to be aware of. Um, so I know that we have some questions coming in from the audience. So just to read off some of those, the one we have up now is, um, Natalie, you mentioned mentors. Can you elaborate on the value of mentors, how you define these relationships, and then how people can enter into these mentor relationships? Yeah, great question, David. I think uh, we definitely toss around mentors a lot. And it, that's because I think it can mean a lot of things. Um, firstly, I'll say that mentorship is usually a two way street. It's bi directional. So you are always both a mentor and a mentee in any pairing, regardless of the age. So if, if you think you're a mentor, um, you're definitely going to be learning from the person who's your mentee and, and back and forth. That's just the way it goes. And it, for me personally, the value of mentors is just hearing experience and lessons learned and how how people who have gone a similar path before me or maybe not even a similar path have overcome obstacles and barriers. But those people are also champions. They they give you the confidence you need to pursue something you might be hesitant to pursue. Um, they, they help you find opportunities whatever it may be. And I think the important part is if if you're getting into a mentor-mentee relationship or, or starting a mentorship, it's okay to have a discussion up front about what the expectations are, about what you hope to get out of that relationship and just make it clear between both people um, what you want out of it. And then another question. So when you are a rocket scientist, how do you sharpen your saw and continue learning? Also, how do you express your creativity in complex jobs like that? Oh, great question. So the the continuing education or continuing learning is is an interesting question. And I think that comes, it can come in multiple ways. So it could be actually um, attending internal ex or external training specifically. It could be going back to school and taking more coursework. And then it could also be experiential on the job learning like all of the projects that i've gotten to do over the years are entirely different so i'm still getting exposed to new things the more i talk to different engineers in different disciplines i just try and soak that all in as a sponge and how do i express creativity in a complex job like that that i don't know if i've ever been asked that question um for me as a systems engineer the the creative side is actually more related to communication and how to tell a story. So it's about taking that high level mission goal of what we want to achieve and breaking that down into step by step tasks of how we're going to achieve it and then trying to communicate that to our team, making sure that our team's communicating and then communicating that back to either the customer or the public. So for me, that's how I express the creativity of my job. Perfect. And then from Andrew, we have, how hard is it to apply for a position in MDA as a recent international PhD graduate in robotics? Well, we have lots of job postings up right now. So it's um, just a matter of finding a position that might be good for you, going through the um, required steps to submit an application and then and seeing where it goes from there, from the hiring um, staff. And then if you knew you were not going to be selected for the astronaut program, then then would you have done anything differently and would you have pursued anything else? Great question. Um, it's a difficult one. <laughs> it is. And I've never had that frame to me uh, that way either. I, you know, I think I still would because everything that I've done, I never anticipated I would be doing. And it's just, 
I've had so many unique opportunities. Like I never thought I'd be building a rover that's going to go to another planet or getting to come do a keynote here with you all today. Like um, one, one other thing I've learned along the way indirectly related to being rejected is that there's no wrong path to go down. I think a lot of young people that I speak to, that's one of their major concerns about making a wrong decision or a wrong turn. And I really don't think that exists. We just have different opportunities to go down different paths in our lives and different paths teach us new things and give us different experiences. And it's just being about being open to new opportunities. And, and again, um, having a willingness to learn as much as you can, regardless of the path you take. Perfect. Um, so thank you, Natalie. What do you say to people who say that the broad scope of activities you pursued may be distracting from the main vision? And is it better to focus on one activity and then excel in it? Oh, so this is actually a really interesting question for me as a systems engineer, because for me to do my job well i i am not an expert in any one discipline i don't focus on any one discipline i'm not doing like structural analysis or thermal thermal analysis i have to have a broad understanding of all of the disciplines in order to ask questions and poke holes and make sure that we're building the right thing and so for me i'm always going to say that having a broad understanding of things and a, and a willingness to see different perspectives and different approaches to doing things is all in support of the main vision, not distracting from it. As long as you you keep that vision in mind and it's there, um, I don't think you need to focus on one activity and excel in it. But that's also situation and person dependent for sure. Like that's what worked for me. And there's lots of people who love just focusing on one thing or becoming a specialist. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that either. Perfect. Well, I know that we can probably ask you questions all day, but that's our time. And thank you again, Natalie, so much. Definitely a very inspirational um, speech and then question and answer session. Thanks so much, Paige. Appreciate it.
I had the coolest job that any electrical engineer could ever have on the ground crew for Solar Impulse 2, the first solar powered airplane to fly around the world only using the power of the sun. IEEE USA has given me a competitive edge because of their support system. It is so much easier doing something and being out of your comfort zone when you have someone there saying, you got this. IEEE USA is more than just a network, it's a family. Hi everyone, my name is Graham Fuller and I'm part of the Mercer Affinity Leadership Team. For those of you who don't know, Mercer Affinity is the Insurance Program Administrator for the IEEE Member Group Insurance Program. For over 60 years, IEEE and Mercer Affinity have been proud partners in serving the insurance needs of IEEE members and their families. The IEEE Member Group Insurance Program provides insurance solutions such as life insurance, professional liability insurance, health insurance, disability insurance, and much more. We're also excited to be able to provide additional solutions such as telemedicine, counseling, and vision discount services through our partners at New Benefits. And coming soon, we're excited to announce the introduction of Tech Protect, a solution to protect smartphones, tablets, computers, gaming consoles, TVs, and monitors from accidental damage, all for less than $20 a month. I'd like to invite you to explore all the solutions available to you through your IEEE membership by visiting IEEEinsurance.com. Here's wishing you a productive and meaningful EVO 21 conference. Thank you.
Greetings, everybody. I'm John Yaglinski. I'm IEEE USA's Director of Communications and Information Technology. And I'd like to welcome you all to our panel session on future trends and technology. Over the next 45 minutes to an hour, we'll take a look at where technology is today, where things are headed, and what that means for your future while peering into the world of tomorrow and what it'll look like. We'll also forecast possible new opportunities and career paths moving forward. With me on the virtual stage today, right now, I think I have two out of my three amazing individuals. Right now, we're waiting for John Collins to possibly teleport in. But in the meantime, we've got Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. Hello. Hi, good Nikki. afternoon or good morning, wherever you happen to be in the world. <laughs> hey there. Nikki's founder and lead presenter at Transport Evolved, a YouTube channel that focuses on the world of cleaner, greener, safer, and smarter transportation. She and her team focus on covering a wide swath of e-mobility industry, covering everything from million-dollar sports cars, yes, to affordable DIY projects, equitable access to clean transportation and energy security. Lots of great things there. Uh, she lives outside of Portland, Oregon with her wife, her teenage daughter, dogs, and a bunch of chickens. Good to have <laughs> you on board, Nikki. Good to be here. I'm very excited about today's panel. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, we're looking forward to having you here and you're possibly out miking me with that wonderful setup. <laughs> All right, moving on to uh, join the panel as well. We've got Amy Peck. Uh, some of you may know Amy from Evo 19. We're glad to have her back. Amy is founder and CEO of Endeavor XR, a leading global VR XR or AR and XR strategy and consulting firm. XR is that kind of combination of everything together, right, Amy? Exactly. Yep, she is uh, recognized as a thought leader in the space and speaks on uh, speaks globally on the future of XR. She's a venture partner at Capital Region AR VR Accelerator, holds several advisory board roles and co-founding chair of the VR ARA Enterprise Committee. Her own personal mission is to see XR fundamentally improve every aspect of our lives with the goal of making this technology accessible and transformative for everyone. A big Evo welcome to you, Amy. Good to have you here. Thanks so much, John. Yeah, and like I mentioned, John Collins is supposed to join us from Berlin, Germany. Hopefully, like I said, he'll teleport in somewhere during the show and uh, be able to join in the conversation. But uh, let's go ahead and jump right in. Got a lot to talk about. Got tons of things to cover here. But I'll start by saying, um, you know, since our childhood, we've kind of been promised and in some cases even sold a vision of the future, right? So in the uh, late 50s, Disney Imagineers presented their magic highway, including solar powered hover cars and underwater superhighways, 
By the way, I actually saw this in the 1970s in elementary school, so I'm not that old. Um, in the 60s, we saw the Jetsons live in floating cities, ride in flying cars to work, and of course have an AI-powered robot named Rosie. Um, in the 70s, it was Logan's Run, where it looked at utopian life existing in dome bubble cities. And of course, like in every science fiction movie, that wasn't until something went horribly wrong. Um, I could walk you through each decade and their prediction of what's ahead, uh, but a fun way to begin is to ask, given the vision that we all have been presented with, what are you most surprised by in 2021 uh, that we haven't seen technology-wise? Possibly something you're, you're sure that we'd have on a daily basis by now, or even possibly the flip side of the equation, what could you never have imagined but yet we have today and use on an almost regular basis. Did I well, let's just start? Go ahead, Nikki. <laughs> well, I mean, I wanted just to say uh, to start. Thank you, Amy. Uh, John, I think these visions of the future are really important to inspire and get people excited about the future. You know, I'm a I'm a total nerd. I love Star Trek. I love right. science fiction, and. My childhood growing up was influenced by a lot of those things. Right. You know, in, in I think it was 1983, I there was this magazine called The Book of Knowledge, which was this bi-weekly periodical that you could get. And you got it and you put it in a binder and then it was an encyclopedia. And my sisters, who were much older than me, was were given that by my parents. And I remember reading it as this kind of precocious five-year-old seeing a picture of an, an electric car and it was a cutaway and it showed the batteries. And back then I remember being super excited about it. And right. that actually helped shape my career and where I am today. But in right. terms of, of things that I, I think I'd all hoped that we'd have by now, energy independence was one of them. I, I expected us all to be making our own energy at home. Some yeah. of us are, right? I've got 15 kilowatts of solar panels on my home, but most of us aren't. And I think until we have energy independence and everybody can generate energy on their roofs, we're never really gonna have an equitable setup when it comes to green technology and future vision. And I think that's the thing that has really disappointed me. The thing that I'm really excited and I never expected us to have, at, certainly at this point, was satellite internet that is so fast that we don't have to worry about lag times that allows us to game. I know it's in beta. I am a, you know, disclaimer, I am a Starlink beta tester. Okay. And I live in the middle of nowhere in rural Oregon. And without that, my internet connection wouldn't be as fast as it is. Sure, it's got some bugs, but that's amazing that we're beaming internet from low earth orbit back to earth to allow people all around the world to ultimately have connectivity to the rest of the world. And connectivity is really important Absolutely. if we're gonna if we're gonna share ideas and it allows people to have hopefully equitable access to information wherever they live. So that's my take. No, I, I could totally nerd out on that. Maybe we may circle back on that because I wasn't even aware that the the uplink now was a thing with that or how do they did how they do that separately or whatever. But okay, setting that aside because that's a really cool technology, and I agree with you. Like how our our um, youths kind of shape where we have gone to. I mean, which is why I brought up those things. Those obviously were things that made an impact on me in the beginning. And we even heard uh, Natalie talk about her love of sci-fi, Stargate, Star Trek, and things like that. So uh, before I give you my um, uh, ones that I expected would be here or that I'm surprised isn't, Amy, what are, what are your thoughts? Where are you on that? Yeah, I mean, I like that you point to all of this media that we've all been consuming because yeah. I, I, I even kind of zoom out and, and think, you know, what if we all actually had more of a hand in the creating of that vision? Because I always use Minority Report as the example, right? That there's, right. It's, it's no accident that, you know, augmented reality looks like Minority Report because- right. We don't take the time to come up with our own vision. We see that and we go, well, that looks pretty good. Let's do that. Um, 
and so anyway, but I want to go back to your question before we go off on a total tangent. Um, yeah, which is I, okay. I, <laughs> I, I think it's, and, it, and it's, it's very much in line with what Nikki said. I think it's just being able to access data and communicate remotely the way that we do seems very Star Trek-y, right? <laughs> right. Um, and, and, and just, I remember the first time I went into the, um, not the first time I went into the subway, but when I first went into the subway and there was, Go you know, Google had sponsored Wi-Fi. Right. In the New York City subway, which was the death, that was the death zone, right? So you were in sort of, the, you know, basically the the cloak of, of anti-communication once you're down there, like you're in the subway, you're like, I got to go, I'm going down to the subway and you're done. Um, yeah. And and just, you know, being able to have this whole kind of underground city and still be connected, I I, I thought and think is amazing. And so I think it's very similar to, to what Nikki describes with Starlink. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, my, my thinking on on where we are today and and what I'm surprised we don't have is actually a more recent construct, which is the wearable. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that in 2020, which would have made perfect sense, right? The new, you know, like AR, at least at least kind of the heads up display version of these glasses, like good ones in 2020, because yeah. that would have made perfect sense. And even the, um, you know, the wearable fabrics, uh, there, there's been a lot of experimentation. They're even now um, haptic suits. And so I just think, you know, this wearable, you know, evolution and revolution that's about to occur. And, and maybe it's just that I wanted it more than I expected <laughs> it. Um, but I'm trying to will it into existence because I, I just love that idea now that, that we're not, act, you know, we won't have to access data on a 2D screen in in within the next decade you know that, that effect, effectively the world the world will become our screen correct it's an interesting thing isn't it though because i think as that technology segues into being omnipresent in our lives and it already is with our you know our cell phones our watches whatever i think we'll also have to from a societal point of view figure out how we disconnect from that. And I think that's going yeah. to become as an important part of our lives as the data we consume. That yeah. is, yeah, that's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, John. No, absolutely. I'm 100% agreeing with that. Uh, I, I'm going to give you mine, which is, and, and I've ranted to people before about this. Why don't I have a flying car by now? <laughs> I, I, I was sold on that from such an early age that we would have a flying car. Every every vision of the future, I, I was sure by 2000 that we would at least have that. And we, we do not have that seriously yet. There, I know they exist. I know there are. But I, I thought it would be commonplace that. And, and I'm a little bit surprised that our clothes aren't a little bit shinier. <laughs> in, uh, in, and form fitting. <laughs> Although they are, fitting. they are. Like I'm in now Lululemons 24 seven. Like, well, you know, okay. I mean, there is that. Um, <laughs> the, the, the thing that I, I maybe couldn't have seen, honestly, it just are how transformative this devices have become. Uh, uh, you know, things from cell phones and things you carry al along with you and how much power there is in the computing. I, I, as a kid, I don't think I could have figured that. And plus I got my Dick Tracy watch where I can talk to people. So, you know, I, I mean, these sort of things, I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised where we are in that, but so this is going to segue very nicely into the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is actually tech stagnation. Um, and here's what I mean by that is, you know, what will the relationship between humans and computers look like in five, 10, 25 years? Um, essentially, the way we're interacting with computers today really hasn't changed much since the first GUI. I mean, if you start thinking about where we started with Apple and Microsoft and, and the, the first graphical user interface and where we are today, a, a user of the first probably iPhone, iOS, would, would reasonably be able to navigate through what's going on in their screen. And if you used Windows back in the day, and Windows 3.1 anywhere, and certainly by the time Windows 95 came out, you're certainly using pretty much the same operating system, the way it looks. Granted, stability, you know, niceties, cute transitions, all that kind of stuff have happened along the way. But I mean, what's it going to take to move beyond 
where we are, you know, what will it take to get, be there? What will the interface look like? I'm going to go to Amy first on this one as you're kind of the VR, AR, all yeah. encompassing initial thing. Yeah, the XR <laughs> extended reality, yeah. whatever we want to yes. talk about. We have done a bad job on, on that whole nomenclature. But anyway, yeah. that notwithstanding, um, you know, we, I think as we move to spatial computing, um, that that user interface is gonna be really critical because we don't really know how people are going to intuitively interact with digital objects in the real world and, and what those what that looks like. And you know, you mentioned Apple. I think I think what Apple does a really good job of and, and maybe some of the other companies that you talked about don't <laughs> um, is they're very good at at kind of looking at how uh, the end user interacts with the device, and then they sort of try and standardize some of those mechanisms and bake it into the SDK so that it be, we think it becomes intuitive, right? But it's, mm -hmm. it's really, you know, how, how we were interacting with the device. It's sort of this, again, going back to the, this notion of collect, you know, collective consciousness, I think we all have certain instincts that we fall back on. Uh, and then when they get, you know, a big enough sample size of how we want to interact with this data, they, they, they want to make it a standard, which is, I think, why some of it hasn't changed. I think it's really hard for people, even today, um, you know, this digital divide is widening with people who didn't grow up as digital natives, um, you know, are, are sort of aging out of the technology because it's, it, you know, it, they were just a little bit too old when that this evolution happened. And, and now it just becomes kind of hard for them. So I think we have to be careful about how we um, build the, you know, the user interface for these and make it as seamless and intuitive as possible. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, Nikki, where, where do you feel like we are? And so where do you think we're headed? it is a really interesting one, right? Because if you have been using technology since, you know, eighties, which I right. have, mm -hmm. things are very intuitive and you do have this feeling of stagnation. But I think also we need to be careful of two things. Change for change's sake is not always a good way forwards. Mm -hmm. And B, it's okay to accept that certain technologies have reached a stable point. Think about the QWERTY keyboard. We've used the QWERTY keyboard now for well over a century. Right. And it's still the fastest way of us getting information in. Now, someone can come along and go, okay, I've developed this fancy cording keyboard and you hold it like this and it reduces your RSI. And for that person, that accessible technology makes their input and their experience of the user technology much faster. And I think what we, what I'd like to see, and I think what we've started to see is that there are now more accessible technologies coming in to supplement the traditional user experience. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that people who have uh, sight impairments, mm -hmm. who are blind, cannot access the world in the same way as people who have sight. And so there has been a real barrier of entry for decades in accessing information. Only really in the last decade have we seen affordable, reproducible braille displays that actually speed up access to data. And I think what we're going to see is a rise in accessibility technology and we need to see a rise in accessibility technology before we start worrying about whether we're still using a screen or not. I think some paradigms are okay to keep around for a while. Some technologies are okay to keep around for a while. The point and click, the wheel in the car. And look, I cover the electric auto industry. It's, it's my wheelhouse. And this past week, Tesla unveiled its Model S Plaid. It's a car that has a Knight Rider style, Knight Rider style yoke instead of a steering wheel. And there's been lots of speculation about how that would work. And lots of people have said that's cool. <laughs> hmm. But then when you see the videos that are now surfacing online of people trying to use that yoke in the real world, it is a complete, yeah. uh, I'm a, an unashamed disaster because right. people are trying to use this, this right. yoke steering wheel to control the vehicle when 
the wheel was fine in the first place. So I think we have okay. to be cognizant of not making change for change's sake. And I think when true intuitive changes happen, like the touch and drag and click methodology that we've seen since the first iPhone, mm -hmm. that's going to naturally um naturally going to propagate through the industry but i think yeah. if we're just trying too hard to come up with new and fancy ways of interacting with stuff it's not gonna it's not gonna work yeah i think not, you, you were gonna say it's not gonna fly right like the flying yeah. cars we're gonna yeah. go right back to <laughs> hey, hey. we don't we don't, don't want to continue you know poking that particular bear still waiting, but, but no i i so i like I, I agree, you know, change for just change's sake doesn't work. I think Microsoft tried to do that with Windows 8 and, and it just <laughs> yeah. fly with folks. Although I personally like the interface, but hey. Um, but the point being, I, I think I thought that voice recognition and natural language interaction with computers would have come a lot further. Um, than it is at this point. And Alexander in the chat mentions what vo voice recognition is improving. It is. And certainly there's, there's some things that, uh, you know, the way my, I, I mean, I'm just going to call it the A word behind me, the, the <laughs> way I interact with the A word. Um, you know, I, I think we reached a transition at some point where when I was going to sleep and I said, you know, uh, you know, set an alarm for such and such a time. And it said, John, are you aware that three doors are unlocked? Would you like me to lock them? And I thought, okay, now we've actually hit a level of technology where I kind of expected maybe we would be by now. And But that's the only thing that it's ever done that has come close to that. So transitioning into the next thing here would be your daily routine. It's 20, 31, 10 years from now. What's your day look like? I mean, how do you see technology being used or integrated into your daily routine? Do you see a huge shift in the way we live? Or will we, as Amy's friend and mine, uh, Maxim Jago says, and by the way, he's an Evo panel uh, pro host, um, you know, the core of what it is to be human won't change. That essentially you know, we'll just go on with our lives and things will just continue to evolve. Or do you see like in 10 years, do we take this big jump and what, what's your day look like? Amy, I know you've done talks on this in the past, certainly. Um, what's it like in 2031? Yeah. And, I mean, and, and, you know, and it'll follow then too, what kind of careers develop as a result of, of, of the way technology goes? Well, the, you know, the exercise that, that, you know, I'm, I'm, hoping that that people take time to do is is kind of you know go back to when we were you know five and six you know you ask a five-year-old like what you know what how they want to travel or the coolest thing in their lives and they can come up without even blinking like oh well obviously I'm gonna hop in my rocket ship I'm gonna go to the moon I'm gonna right. play with my purple giraffe we're gonna have cheese sandwiches and then we're gonna come back to Earth we'll be back in time for dinner and Mom's gonna make me mac and cheese because that's my favorite thing in the whole wide world right and it's just, it's it's seamless right you ask a grown up what their future looks like and they give you kind of pat answers right it's like oh I just want to be secure I want to be retired I want to make enough money so I can just travel or whatever it is right but. You know, I think what's fun about this is that we could write, you know, think of it as a blank canvas, like, like fill it with something, right. you know, write something really fascinating because the, it's not about what you come up with because we do these, these workshops all of the time. And when I kind of drill down and, and parse the data, it's a Venn diagram, right? You get the outliers who are like, super visionaries and they have these kind of crazy wild ideas, but they're not actually crazy and wild because they could absolutely occur in the next you know, 20 or 30 years. But at our core, it is humanity. I mean, just like our mutual friend, you know, Maxim says, you know, it's, it, we do want the same things and we want to be able to communicate. We want to be, we want to feel part of something. And so I think A, we need to, to create that future vision and B, we need to use technology to augment the human experience and not overtake us and not consume us. And one thing that started to come up recently that's very much in line with what Nikki said is that, you know, I, I was going through some of the, the answers that some people gave during a workshop and one of them said, oh, I've decided to opt out of Neuralink. 
And, you know, I think that, you know, it, we, we are going to need to be able to have the option to, to completely unplug and be close to nature, because that, again, is another part of that fundamental human need. Like, you know, it's, 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 it goes right along with being part of something. We need to feel part of something bigger, and, and nature does that. So I think some of those elements are the way that I visualize the future. And I have a very specific future, but we can talk about that another time. Yeah. The, next, the next Evo. Yeah, absolutely. Nikki, what do you think? I think there's a there's a disparity between what I would like to be happening and what I think will actually happen. And I think that, again, as Amy was saying, that's kind of a curse of being an adult. And the older you get, I think the more kind of um, skeptical you become of what is actually going to happen. I hope that I don't become any more skeptical because I'm only 41 at the moment. And <laughs> God, if I become more skeptical, I think there's going to be a disaster. But yeah. what I would love to happen is for there to be lots of smart technology that integrates seamlessly with my home in a way that I don't have to think about it. So for example, actually my my partner was telling me this yesterday. We, you know, we sat down and we looked at the, I opened up the app for my solar panels. It's like, huh, we generated 40 kilowatt hours on the roof. And, yeah. and she said, that's kind of the perfect technology because it's just doing its thing. We don't have to worry about it. Right. Um, I would love for us to have smart technology that help monitors our health. I hope that there are better monitors available for me. I suffer from a medical condition that, that it could kill me. And right now I'm on medication that ensures that the risk of me dying from that um, condition is very reduced, but it has side effects. I would love to be in a future where nanotechnology comes along and keeps things under control so I don't have to be on that medication so I can do all of the other things that I used to enjoy doing. Um, yeah. The reality though is I think in 10 years, uh, I'm going to have a, I already have an electric car, but I'm going to have electric cars plugged in to the front of my house that will automatically know that in 10 minutes I need to leave to go and make that appointment and automatically precondition my car, automatically make sure that there's enough charge in my battery pack. I know that I want my my home to know if there is a storm coming and there's a risk that my power's going to go off so that my car can actually charge up enough so that if there's a power card, it automatically switches over to my, uh, my batteries in my car and charges my, effectively provides power to my home so right. I can still do all the things at home that I would normally want to do. And my vision, I think, of 10 years' time is that technology has got to a point where we can continue to live our, quote, normal life with as minimal an impact as possible to all of the effects of anthropogenic climate change that we've brought upon ourselves. So that technology allows us to do that. I also think that VR is going to come on in that time. And I would love to see more immersive technology that doesn't require a VR headset. You know, you can see there's two VR headsets behind me on the wall there. While that experience is fun, I would love to see kind of a, a projector style um, setup where what I see in the real world and what I see from the virtual world become one and merged. But again, that's a pie in the sky. I don't think that's going to happen in 10 years. I know it started to happen, but bringing that to commercial fruition is going to take time and money. I want my own holodeck right in my house. That would right. be awesome if we could actually do that. So, uh, Again, the segues just continue. Mr. Blue asked a question about Amy, what would be the next thing, big thing that'll happen in the field of AR and VR? And I'm gonna extend that a little bit and ask also, um, you know, how is VR, AR, uh, you know, what an impact is it gonna have on the future of work? I mean, we've already seen coming out of the pandemic, um, boy, all the major manufacturers that created all these spaces to do collaboration have kind of upped their game. It's about time, I will say, as somebody who's been holding uh, WebEx meetings and, and the like and Zoom meetings and stuff for the last, I don't know how many years now working remotely, that it, it really has kind of 
taken it to the next level in the last year and a half. So that was a good side effect of, of what all happened. There aren't many good ones. Um, but you know, what, what are we going to be looking at more realistic training? Um, our virtual meetings going to get better. I mean, I mean, what are the technologies you see coming down the pike in that space that'll improve the way we work, the way we collaborate and, you know, and the way we have fun. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, definitely, you know, collaborative virtual environments, and you see that with both AR and VR. Um, and the RARA, like big global summit they had last week, we did it in alt space. Um, we probably had about 60 people drop in live. And when we say drop in, some of them literally drop in. Um, but, but uh, you know, so, so that's actually been great because I think we do suffer from a little bit of Zoom fatigue. Uh -huh. so it's kind of nice to be able to go into this virtual environment. You can see people's avatars. You can have physicality. Um, I also have a Magic Leap sitting right here, um, and you know they they have a beta application that I've been using and collaborating in. And the thing I like about that is that you know we can bring in two D and three D assets and and you know kind of walk around them, but I'm not going to trip over the coffee table. You know, so it's like I can still see my surroundings. Um, right. And where we, where we want to get to is where we have these, um, you know, and VR can offer this, where we, where we can create spaces that are persistent so that whenever we go into them, if we did a whiteboard session, if it's for work or if we're in the middle of a chess game, if it's for play, uh, or if you happen to work where you play chess, that's even better. But, you know, these are some of the ways that we're finding and we're feeling our way, right? Because it's a weird experience. You, you know, you're a cartoon you it doesn't the tracking doesn't always work um <laughs> we had one of the guys was literally announcing that he you know in, we were in alt space and he was he was announcing that you know i have a show and it's called failure to render and he literally froze at that very moment which was kind of funny <laughs> there's so, some irony in that like, yeah. Yeah, there you go. um and so you know he got booted out and he had to come back <laughs> so it's not quite there yet and it's still for early adopters yeah. But it's so it, we you really feel connected, right? And you can have actually real productive meetings in in v, both VR and, and AR. And it, it's true for play as well. I mean, um, yeah. because of COVID, a lot of communities that would traditionally meet up and have events, whether it was cosplay, whether it was furry, whether it was any other, you know, group of people who met up regularly virtual reality actually kept those communities functioning during COVID-19. People creating custom avatars that were very, very um, flamboyant, that were very uh, much representative of who they felt they were rather than who they were in the real world, actually allowed people to survive COVID, months of not seeing people physically, allow people to stay safe, and has actually become a subculture, which really fascinates me. The number of people now online conventions are becoming a thing right. in the virtual world. Um, people just sign in to VR right. and they yeah. attend panels and they have dancers, they have dance yeah. competitions, they do all of these things with motion tracking and all of that that allows them to continue to experience the world without putting their own physical um, well-being at risk. And I've, I've found that truly inspirational. Of course, there's a little more of a barrier of entry to that than the kind of the everyday uh, sort of VR space that you plop in as a cartoon character or a floating head or something like that, where, you know, it's interesting, but that's a, a, quite a distance from probably using your headset and, or even a an AR headset and, and uh, participating. Um, I, I don't have one yet. I must get one. <laughs> I, I'm a little behind. John, we have to we yeah, we have to we have to rectify that so we can yeah, we, can I know. All go, we can all go play in all space. Okay. All right. It's a deal. Uh let's let's shift uh, just for a moment out of the uh XR world and turn to the other area of expertise, which is transportation. Uh and possibly the future of transportation there as well. Uh similarly what are we going to look like there in 10 years? Are autonomous vehicles actually going to gain widespread acceptance, daily use? Will they be limited to niche roles possibly like taxis or long truck hauling? How about my flying cars? Is that going to happen? 
You can see, I'll, I'll keep bringing that up. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I, I think, but, Vitol, but I mean that, yeah, smart roads, maglev, hyperloop, underground roads. Oh, and the last one that I loved, floating hotel pods to travel via massive drones while you're sleeping. Oh, that that's something straight out of my steampunk fantasy, that last I one. I love that. Wouldn't that um, be great? <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> the the um yeah i mean like go to sleep in a in a in, a, in an airship and travel yeah that sounds like right? that sounds like fun like, um I, we've we should be able to have that technology i mean we've had enough time since hindenburg to understand what we should and shouldn't be doing correct. with giant airships um yeah, all jokes really, aside you know vtol yeah. craft i think are going to become the norm in major cities major metropolises we are seeing more and more people move to cities Although, again, in a post-COVID world, that is reverting to people yeah. wanting to live in the country because people right. don't want to live in major cities because they don't want to be cheek by jowl with their neighbors in case their neighbors are sick. And I think that has taught a lot of people to want to go into the country and experience that. In terms I mean, of transportation... Nikki, let's, be, let's be honest. There are a lot of other reasons not to want yes. to live in yes, the city absolutely. Well. <laughs> I mean, just, just I'm a far, sick, I, my, my excuse is I grew up on a dairy farm in the UK. Well, and go. when I moved to America... I have been desperately wanting to find a place to live in the country. In fact, one of the reasons we moved here is because land is cheaper and we could afford to do that, which we couldn't do in the UK. Um, but in terms of transportation, I think autonomous vehicle technology has been a red herring for the industry for a really long time. And we've become so focused on autonomous vehicle technology and the safety benefits that it can bring to the table that we're forgetting that there are some other priorities. Changing our fuel use. And mm -hmm. while I think autonomous vehicles will ultimately take off, I think it's going to take legislators a very long time. And I'm one of a number of people who believe that the way that Tesla is going about its autonomous vehicle technology is not helping because instead of working with legislators and going, okay, these are the goalposts, we meet these goalposts, now let us drive on the road. It's mm -hmm. just going ahead and pushing out this technology which while the technology is working a lot of the time and is reducing accidents and is safe, is also causing a lot of backlash when things go wrong. And having a legal framework for that technology, personally, I believe, is paramount. And we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that investment. Yeah. But in terms of autonomous taxi services, I think they are going to be coming in the next 10 years. Oh, yeah. I think we are also going to see... Um, we have to see a paradigm shift in the way that we look at car ownership and the way that we look at the fuel sources that we're using. You know, we have to move towards cleaner, greener fuel choices in order for us to actually make a, an effect on the needle of climate change. Yeah. We're going to see a lot of one of the industries that is developing at breakneck speed right now is battery technology. We are seeing yeah. breakthrough batteries on an on an almost weekly basis. Solid state technology is really exciting. It's coming to the fore. We have to move away from the current lithium, iron, manganese, cobalt sort of uh, chemistries because of the challenges associated with the ethics of mining cobalt with the difficulty in getting certain materials out of the ground and shipping it around the world. And I think we are going to see a solid state battery breakthrough in the next five to 10 years in commercial vehicle spaces. We've already got solid state buses operating in parts of the world. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the transition to better fuel sources for vehicles is accompanied by a realization that we just can't keep making really fancy expensive cars because otherwise we're gonna make a social a real big social disparity between the haves and the have nots. And it doesn't matter how many people have a hundred thousand dollar sports car. If then neighbors five miles away can only afford to buy a used vehicle, they need to have an option that is green for them. So I, I believe that the transition to uh, 10 years time for transportation means we're going to see a lot more vehicle as a service, renting a car rather than owning it, because I think for a lot of people that's going to be the only option. 
Mm-hmm. And I think hopefully we're going to see some legislative effort to try and bring more affordable vehicles to the fore, whether it's through changing incentive programs, whether it's through retrofitting programs. I think that's the only thing we can do. In terms of air travel, I think we're going to see electric planes taking off. I think we're also going to see a an attitude change that is spurred by VR and AR, where people are no longer feeling the need necessarily to travel to visit people, but are more interacting in a virtual space with them. And I think we're going to have to accept that if we want to reduce our carbon emissions and make sure that our transition is safer and smarter. So I'm slightly surprised that we're we're at this point that that smart roads haven't played a little more of a role in all this. I mean, I would have thought that it would have been easier to transition it, it, rather than moving to the autonomous cars to be able to have some sort of system, possibly only on the interstates or whatever, possibly only with dedicated lanes, things along that lines, where, where cars are able to travel at greater s- speeds and closer together and bigger distances. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised that hasn't happened by now. That would be, that probably could have been an answer to one of the, the first questions I asked. There are things that I'm surprised hadn't happened by now. I think that the ultimate problem to all of this is that we humans are very selfish and we are control freaks and we like having control. There's been recent yeah. studies talking about acceptance of autonomous vehicle technology. And honestly, we're still hovering at around or below 50% acceptance among <laughs> Question. early adopter groups. Yep. And then, as someone's just said, how do you propose to eliminate the human factor for autonomous vehicles? Individuals do not trust in robots having control. And I think that is ultimately the, the issue. We, we are control freaks. We like having control. And I think until we are at a point where we can develop what essentially would be a Turing test for autonomous vehicle technology, we're not going to be there. And we're, in a lot of cases, we're not even there with natural language. You know, right. my my A word that sits in my bedroom, <laughs> I can ask her a question. Right. And mm, 75% of the time, she'll get the answer. And I have developed a bit of a nighttime routine where I try and catch out that uh, automated assistant by making a very long and convoluted sentence and throwing in the words, the command words. And surprisingly, 80%, 90% of the time, it gets it. But we're still not at that natural language, no matter what marketing says, we're still not at natural language in everyday commercial applications. We might be in the laboratory, but we're not in the commercial world. And I think until we're at that point where we're capable of passing that Turing test for automation, Turing test for interaction, people are not going to trust. Yeah. So um, kind of an overarching theme on all of this um, and and things we've seen recently going on problems, uh, problem-wise, are uh, cybersecurity. So, you know, a bigger challenge is all these uh, devices get connected, the more we have the IoT, the connected cars, the connected fridge, the A word behind me. I mean, we can go on, you know, everything that's around us. I mean, just look someday if, if, if you know how to get into it, look at your router and see how many devices are connected at any one time in your house. And I think you'll be probably surprised. Um, you know, how do we secure these systems, um, you know, now and into the future? I mean, has the proliferation of ransomware attacks kind of changed the game? I mean, what are we going to do to make sure as we move forward, because this is, this goes to the trust issue, by the way, with the, with absolutely with the robots and everything like that. If I can't trust the technology, if I can't trust that somebody's going to like, let's say hack into my pacemaker or something like that, or, you know, cause there's med tech and connected devices there as well. I mean, wh- what are we going to do? I mean, where, how do you see those things improving? Obviously there's a huge career opening for folks going into that that area. Amy, what, what do you see? I mean, as far as security moving forward and, and the setbacks or, you know, yeah. you know, it, 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 this has always been a problem. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's always a little bit of a race, you know, it's like, there's, there's always gonna be someone trying to crack the code, trying to break into something, a 
it's only a matter of time before you you have um, you know algorithms being written to to automate hacking, yeah. uh, you know, and to just try you know try every conceivable uh, option to try and break into a security system. Um, and yeah, certainly as we get more connected and, and certainly as we have much more intimate, um, especially immersive experiences, you can't unsee something that, that you know, you're shown in, in VR. Um, and right. again, our, our, our medical devices that, you know, we, that we're wearing all the time is, is, is incredibly dangerous. And so it's, it's, yes, it's an opportunity, but it's, it's something that we are always going to fight. You know, I'd like to say that there's some easy answer you know the 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 you know war against uh, you know good versus evil wages on. It's the stuff yeah. of all the movies that we've grown up on, right? It's like right. <laughs> Evil Corp. It's just Evil Corp <laughs> right now. Is you know who? Um, right. But uh, it is. I mean, it, it is. <laughs> It's so like is, the, is the is the answer to get more good people into uh, the profession and to start caring about this sort of stuff? Yeah, and, I mean, that's I mean, part of it. That's part of it. And part of it is is our, our I think our responsibility to start um, to start taking more control over our own data, and you know we whine about uh, you know this data being out there and and we are being manipulated as we know to an unbelievable degree. Yeah. Even being aware of it doesn't solve the problem. However, we don't understand how hard it's going to be to manage all of that data. And I think the beauty of, of you know, blockchain and this kind of digital landscape um, that, that's sort of coming upon us, if you imagine we'll have our avatars as our digital representative in, in, the, in the digital landscape, you'll have your public persona and your private persona, and you need to actually be able to manage what data goes where. Yeah. And so that is gonna be an interface and anyone who's listening, if this is for me, one of the biggest career opportunities is if you build the interface that allows us to manage and monetize our data using blockchain and microtransactions and cryptocurrency, th that is where we start to solve some of that issue because then we're able to shut down, we'll have an emergency mechanism. We can shut down the flow of data we can uh, have direct relationships with brands, and you know, I'll, I've said it out loud, and I'm sure it's going to put me on some some target list. But you know, advertising agencies need to go away. <laughs> they just they do. We need to stop Ooh. being manipulated. Marketing is a different thing. Like making yeah. somebody aware of something is one thing. Using yeah. people's data to make them desire something they don't need to make them whole, that's not right. So. I know that we're running a bit short on time. Um, yeah, but we got 10 I would, I would <laughs> like to, I would like to suggest that actually the challenge, or sorry, the solution to that challenge, is lies in an area that we're not giving any attention to as a society, and that is education. So let's mm -hmm. swing back to Star Trek, one of my favorite shows. You know, uh, yeah, no. Star Trek: The Next Generation. They had a school on the Enterprise, and the mm -hmm. kids were all trained and educated in certain key technology aspects from a very young age. And so by the time they were old enough to leave school, maybe find a career in life, they already had this fundamental knowledge. And if we look at our education system, really what have we taught our kids today that's different to 30 years ago when I was at school? And the answer is not a lot. We've taught children how to use technology, but we haven't taught them how to really engage with that technology. I remember the Dewey Decimal System. I was the generation who learned how to research things and how to check my research. The generation behind me were in many ways taught to just type it into Google and use the first thing that came into, into the results. I used yeah. to be a teacher before I was, a, I was a musician and a teacher before I became a, a motoring journalist. And so I've seen that in, in reality. And I think in order for us to have a healthy relationship with technology, we need to educate about that technology from a young age. If yeah. you are somebody who doesn't understand how a firewall works, for example, you have mm -hmm. no skills, not through any fault of your own, possibly because you've never learned it or you've never had an aptitude or an interest in it. Yeah. 
you have no idea of knowing how to block bad actors from entering your home network. And we've learned that corporations and businesses will cut corners to save money because they're ultimately at the end of the day, their duty is to their shareholders. So if they can produce a product at a certain price point that produces the product and is reasonably safe, they will do that. Right. And so we are putting our blind faith in corporations, large groups, large organizations, without understanding the implicit functionality of the technology. So my answer to this is we need to be educating children at a young age on how the modern world works, how technology works, and not just this is a computer, you type something into Google and it gives you an answer. Actually yeah. explain the engineering behind it. And I think that's something hopefully that the IEEE Certainly. is, is trying something to do. Yeah. We're um, working on. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, yeah. is explaining that technology in a way that everybody finds it accessible. Look, I don't want everyone to be an engineer. I don't want everybody to be like me. I'm one of those annoying people who has to understand how something works before I use it. But if you understand a fundamental aspect of how something works, you're going right. to survive better in a modern world. We would hopefully never dream of educating our children and sending them out of high school without teaching them how to add things up, how much they, uh, you know, how to budget, how to, how to write a resume. We do all of those things. So why aren't we teaching them how to use technology? So uh, Nikki, to, to your point there, and also a point that John Collins had made in a pre-interview, <laughs> he said, who didn't make it today, apparently, Poor John, I hope everything's well. Uh, that, you know, the barrier to entry for a lot of these things is fairly low. And there's a prolifer proliferation, tough word to say, of, of stuff out there on the internet teaching you how to do things. Um, it's very easy to learn. So, you know, the thought is, um, you know, we as an organization, IEEE, try to further um, you know, the, the career of engineering, obviously, uh, problem solving skills, things along that lines. Um, but as an individual there, there's so much out there that you can, you can do to improve yourself, your space, your world. Um, and so, I mean, we're getting up on, on time here. We did start about five minutes late, but uh, given everything that we've talked about probably in the last 45 minutes, if you're just starting out in your career, where would you invest your time? Uh, or possibly even money in preparing for the future of work? Hmm. Well, I think it's all motivated by what do you care about, right? Because none right. of it matters if you don't care about what you're doing. And I've even heard, you know, my my, my oldest son, boy, if he hears this, he's going to be unhappy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, when he first went to college, he had an idea of what he wanted to do based entirely on a, a, a lifestyle that he wanted to live. Yeah. And he got into it and then, you know, he did one internship and he came back and he said, oh my God, mom, these guys are all expletive, expletive. And, I, and, and he was right. And right. so, you know, I think he realized then now, now he's doing something that he's built for and he loves and he's passionate about and it's night and day. Right. He cares about it and it can be anything and it doesn't, you know, I know we're here talking about technology and, and coding is going to be the new math. I think everyone should learn some coding language. Um, and, and I think that you should start from the future and work backwards and build your career around what you want your personal future to look like and solve those problems that we're going to have in 20 years from now. Cause I guarantee you they're just bigger versions of what's going on today. Good advice. I would say, I would echo that. Find what you love to do and then find a way of getting other people to pay you to do it. Um, if I had got, if I had gone through my life and listened to people saying, don't do this because I would never have become a professional musician. I go. would never have adopted two children. I would never have emigrated to the US and I would never have my own business, um, you know, making videos. Uh, find what you want to do. Find how to grow that. But in terms of the key skills that you have, learn how to be kind to yourself. Learn how to become introspective, but also 
not introspective to the point that you hurt your your mental health. Yeah. Learn cooperation, mm -hmm. and most importantly, learn to critically think. Don't Absolutely. assume that what somebody else is telling you is the God's honest truth. They may be telling you something in good faith that they also believe to be true, but it might not be. <laughs> so learn your own critical thinking skills Absolutely. so that you can problem solve, you can be adaptive, and you can grow as the world grows. I genuinely hope that the day I stop learning is the day I die. And hopefully the, the technology I have here will keep me running for a, for a while. But, you know, that yeah. is ultimately the, oh. the, the end goal. We, we had so, I, we could have, we could have talked for two hours. I had so many other things I wanted to get to. Corey, well, since Corey appeared on the screen, Corey uh, Ruth from the IEEE USA staff. Corey, do we have a question or two we can answer in the, uh, in the, for, you know, final moments? We do. Uh, we've, I've kind of been answering a few of them, uh, kind of throughout here and uh, there have been such great uh, conversations going on. I didn't want to, didn't want to jump in, but uh, I'll do a couple of quick questions here as well from the audience. Um, Margin A, um, and I think if I can get the summary of this, is asking how technology can be used to accelerate green technology. How can we use technology to help save our planet as opposed to just you know, consuming new, uh, new gadgets uh, for the last few years. Uh, we'll, I'll throw that question to you. I would say... A short answer. <laughs> I would say, first of all, read The yeah. Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Okay. okay. And right. follow some of the things Making he did. Okay. But also focus on micro-generation and decentralized solutions focus on giving people the technology they need to change their world and if they can change their world then they can help change everyone's world we need to stop focusing on big uh big projects and focusing on small projects that everyone can accomplish good advice amy well, I would say um, also take a look at a company called Power Ledger, based in Western Australia, because that construct uh, of essentially enabling communities to create their own grids and have total transparency in uh, weighted distribution um, is a construct that we should be using across our communities, not just with power, but really creating a true sort of sharing economy. Great answers. Do uh, one more quick one here. Um, Yasel, uh, I, I think uh, Nikki mentioned earlier about uh, as people get older, they tend to get a bit more jaded, and uh, uh, people who are younger <laughs> have more enthusiasm. But Yasel's wondering as medical advancements extend the average human lifespan, we're, we're typically living longer, do you think that longevity will translate into more rapid developments of technology, or will more people living longer? and to stagnate our technology. Well, that first premise I don't buy at all. I am probably more optimistic today as a choice than I than I was when when I was a kid. Um, Same. And uh, you know, I think that we all need to there's no I I don't understand the concept of sort of waking up and feeling you know, like everything is doom and gloom because it is a choice to kind of look at the world through certain lens. Um, but relative to living longer, well, first of all, I'm not going anywhere. Ships going in, like, yeah, I'm in. I'm like number one on the list, no problem. Um, but I think it's it it, it kind of goes back to um, you know what what do we want from the technology? And in, I think that there's this notion, and this feeds exactly into what Nikki was saying. We just assume that someone is gonna build more cool stuff and they're gonna do it right. Yeah. And then we just get to play with it. And we have a responsibility in that narrative. And so, you know, especially if you are young, that just means that you have more time <laughs> to fix some of these problems. Yeah. Um, you no, know, but I mean, it, it, it is, it's, it's really up to us to engage in life and the solutions and 
you know, upending our education. I mean, Nikki and I, we're going to have to riff off this offline, but you know, let's <laughs> let let's envision yeah. and build the the future that we want. Right? Be, be part of the solution. Yeah. You know? Can I can I jump in there too? Find a good mentor. Uh, I mean, I, in nearly everything that I've done in life, there's been somebody else who's been able to show me the way or lead the way. And it, that doesn't mean you have to follow that direction, but certainly it sets you down maybe a different path than you would have gone otherwise. So um, I, I do want to thank uh, Amy and Nikki for being our guests here today. Like I said, wow, I would love to follow up with this. I have so much more I want to ask both of you. And uh, also disappointed John didn't make it, but uh, we'll try and get him back for a panel. Maybe we can have you all three back again. So lots of fun. Corey, thanks for the questions. Stay tuned. I believe we've got our closing keynote from Nate Ball coming up next. And we hope you're enjoying your day here at Evo 21. Thank you. Hey everybody, welcome back to Evo 21 here, Evo on campus. Next up is Nate Ball. Nate is a busy guy. His multifaceted career is wrapping together many of his pursuits and passion with all the technical challenge and satisfaction that engineering has to offer. In addition to his work building real life Batman gadgets for rescuers at his company Atlas Devices, he applies his creativity and love of performing to all kinds of STEM outreach, from his kids' book series to hosting and producing work on the Emmy Award-winning PBS kids' show, Design Squad Global. Coming to you live from his home workshop, here's Nate. Thank you so much, John, and you, I'm so glad to get to be here. I appreciate the, the warm welcome. and. What a great conference. I've been tuning in uh, since earlier today and boy, do I resonate a lot with all the great things that the other speakers have been saying. Natalie said many things that totally hit home for me. Um, so did the panel just now. And uh, it's just a real pleasure to get to share some of my own story, some of the story that uh, I've been charting along with my good friends and colleagues that I work with on a daily basis. And uh, to get to share a couple of the uh, challenges and um, tactical things that I've learned to help deal with them that have helped facilitate some of the most exciting and fulfilling experiences of my entire life. So um, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, if people have questions, I'll be trying to watch the, the chat and the comments here. Um, I think I'm on a little bit of a delay, so I can't respond in uh, in the very moment, but throw them in there and uh, we'll do some Q&A at the end of my talk. and. Uh, it's just going to be a good time and fun to show you some of what I feel fortunate to get to do almost every day. So I, uh, I've had a number of moments in my career so far where I'm just really pinching myself as hard as I can because I can't believe that I'm getting to do what I'm doing in this moment. This is a picture of me uh, the first time I hung suspended below a helicopter, which was one of the most surreal experiences of my entire life. Uh, my colleagues and I developed this really cool little piece of Batman technology. It's a powered rope ascender. You can clip it to your harness 
and fix uh, a rope overhead, wrap the rope to the device and zip up. I'll show you a video in a minute. And uh, I got to try that out with uh, the Marine Corps in a big exercise in Thailand in 2008. That was the first time I got to try this. We were testing it as a backup hoist capability. And I still remember the feeling of hearing this really awesome sounding, sort of scary large helicopter approaching and then having the realization that this is coming to pick me up and I have to use the thing that I built to go up into it. Is this real? Um, and it was, and uh, it's incredibly, and I, I still just feel so lucky and sort of surprised at, at uh, how these things have gone, but it's, it's one of what feels like a, a growing number of experiences that um, engineering and innovation and pursuing new technology have, have brought into my life. And uh, those other experiences have included finding myself hanging off the side of a building, climbing up window by window, uh, using fancy ladder technology that I've developed with my friends, helping line crews bond onto live transmission lines. This is uh, showing a, a line crew. There's a lineman on our unit. You can see a little red box right there. He has ascended up and is wearing a conductive suit. It's a blend of silver and Nomex. And he is, his body is at uh, 345,000 volts in that moment. He is replacing a, a pin uh, on that plate that's attaching the conductor up to the structure via those insulators. Um, never would I have dreamed that uh, I would get to engage with work like that, much less help make people's jobs easier. Um, and that goes for some of the rescue work we've done as well. I, I found myself working with Rescue One uh, at FDNY and helping them learn how to use our equipment so they can perform rescues off the top of buildings even easier. And it has even taken me into the, the space realm a little bit as well. I was totally digging all the cool things Natalie was saying. I had the really fun experience of uh, getting to work on some spacesuit simulators that we designed and built for NASA to help them do um, testing for a new concept of operation with, uh, with actual spacesuits on because they Apparently they don't want you to just drag around the real thing when you're trying out new, new stuff. And so um, I just feel so lucky to get to touch on all these things. And what has tied it all together is uh, a consistent approach to identify new opportunities, running after them, and feeling comfortable with all of the vast seas of uncertainty you might find yourselves in, uh, in trying to move forward when you're bringing new things into the world. So here's a little video showing uh, what it looks like when you're powered ascending. This is our system. It's an Atlas powered ascender. And I am about to embark up a very tall cliff. This is Cathedral Ledge up in New Hampshire. We brought along a 600 foot long rope, rappelled down so that we weren't just throwing the thing off the top and hoping it didn't hit people on the way down. And uh, I am climbing up at about five and a half or six feet per second, uh, running up on this invention that I got to develop with my friends. We originally started this as a project in school. It was a design competition. And the, the goal was to have students build equipment that could help soldiers in the field. You can see those pole climbers that I'm passing. They had spent like all day on that wall. Um, and we took our technology, we built some rough prototypes and uh, worked on it. It took a long time to get the thing really field ready, but fast forward several years and the equipment is now getting used by line crews. You can launch ropes over the top of a tower and ascend up. It's being used by uh, aircraft crews to perform rescue if they don't have, have a conventional rescue hoist. It is making a difference for rescuers all around the world. And never would I have dreamed that uh, that, that would be happening. When I started this project with my friends, all I knew was that I thought building real life Batman stuff sounded pretty cool. <laughs> and that starting a, a company was apparently a, a potentially good way to, to get to pursue that. Um, and so not only do we now get to work with our power descenders and rescue climbing equipment, we build specialized ladder systems. Uh, we have magnetic climbing systems like you just saw to play real life Spider-Man. And of course, with all these extreme environments that we have to take our equipment through, we are having to test it in a lot of new scenarios. And so it has tested the limits of our capabilities uh, in every dimension. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about engineering. And when I think about 
all the great things it can offer and, and challenge us with, um, it, uh, oops, there we go. Um, it, it can just challenge you all over the place. So it's not only technological things, but um, you can be entrepreneurial to your heart's content, whether you've started your own company or you're working on new solutions within an existing organization. Uh, and it, it challenges your communication, your stamina, your uh, ability to be creative under duress. I mean, engineering facilitates all of these things. And the real limitation is, uh, is I find, um, it far more winds up being about what I'm personally bringing to each situation uh, with, especially with person-to-person -person interaction, even more so than my hard skills. I worked so hard to develop the, the core engineering skills and those are, those are key and those are important. But um, in my experience so far, coming up with the new technology and getting it to work well enough to have at least a prototype, is just, it's such a small sliver of bringing a new thing into the world um, in a way that allows people to actually adopt it and, and, uh, and be willing to adopt it and use it in their organization, in their daily work. Uh, the, the idea and its initial execution has been such a small part of that. So today I wanted to share um, some of the, the approaches and the habits of mind that I've developed, um, some just through my whole life since I've been building stuff since I was a kid, and others that I've developed more intentionally as I've tried to improve my own self-awareness and navigate the challenges that my career have brought me to. Um, in these uh, in these kind of mid career years, um, there's there's a lot to share and talk about, and um, I'm I'm going to try to zip through so we have some time for Q and A because that's really my favorite part toward the end. But um, this is uh, for starters just a quick picture of me as a kid building my very first go kart. I was totally captivated with the idea of go karts when I was little. Wanted to go fast. Couldn't afford an engine of any kind, uh, but we did live on a steep hill, so I went to town making uh, gravity-powered go-karts, and uh, that was just the beginning. I was really fortunate to have parents who were really uh, permissive about the kinds of stuff they let me build. So it was, um, they would take me down to the beach to test out my new land sailor. Uh, they let me tote around my younger sister with helmets on in my high-speed pedal-powered go-kart. Uh, my mom got excited about uh, the idea of building kayaks because she loved biking or <laughs> she loved boating and helped me find some kayak plans. And I totally got excited, built a kayak when I was 12. They even let me build a, a Tesla coil, which I was totally captivated by. Um, I found out about them in my early days of internet usage when I was in eighth grade. I had no idea how to build a Tesla coil, but it was a great uh, experience for me in that I will... I wanted to build it so much, I had to really stretch my uh, my own personally alleged education to figure out enough to, to make it work. I still remember working on that thing for about three straight years from eighth grade to uh, middle of my sophomore year before I saw really any sparks coming off of the top. But for me, having, having a vision of something that I really wanted to make and was so excited about seeing work for the first time, that's what I tap into consistently to keep myself going when things get challenging or when I have to work on the boring ancillary stuff that's still needed to support the facilitation of a new idea. Like, you know, for, for me these days uh, as a CEO, sometimes that involves just having my nose buried in the financials. And while that's not my favorite thing, having, uh, you know, having the balance sheet work out right is important to have our company continue forward in a strong way because that's, that's a primary vehicle for uh, innovation. So here's just a, a kind of favorite picture of mine. This is from a, a big outreach event that I've done uh, a number of years in the past. This is Discover Engineering Family Day in the National Building Museum. And it's I like it because it shows how I feel when I get to do, um, w when I'm kind of living my most exciting experience and it wraps together so many things that I love. Uh, the challenge, the a little bit of fear being up at height. I still get butterflies in my stomach when I'm 12 stories up. Um, it's fun to perform and it's fun to share what I'm excited about with the world because um, I think the more we can all tap into what really motivates us on the inside, like like we've been hearing lots of times today in the presentations, uh, the more that can help drive us and and it's it's that thing we come back to 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 learn more and stretch ourselves and spend more time expanding our horizons outside of our comfort zone. So I, I thought I would share a couple of my favorite, uh, I'm calling it timeless tools to turn out technological triumphs. I just couldn't resist the alliteration there. Um, 
when I think about new technology and where things are going, I, I do enjoy thinking about what the future may bring. But also, I'm not I'm not sitting in a in a crystal ball or reading one, and I really have no idea what's what's truly coming down the line. But what I've found is uh, some of the habits and skills I've developed to deal with uh, the uncertainty and surprises and whiplash that can often happen when you're pushing new technologies forward, those seem to be consistent no matter what the circumstances are and no matter what specific things I'm actually working on. And so that's why I'm, I'm calling it timeless tools. I think these things that I've, I've been trying to employ um, consistently improve the likelihood of success however I'm defining that in a given uh, moment. And they help consistently improve my own personal experience of what it's like to be working on these challenging things. Um, so this is just a quick picture of our early Atlas days. And I'm sharing it because I wanna start here by focusing on some of those transitions between an early employment of a new technology uh, and then how do you take it forward? So it's there's a picture of me in the center there, spending lots of time in front of the CNC mill making prototype parts for that, that green power to center prototype you see on the right. Um, there's me and my friend Dan. We still work together. It's been almost 20 years. This is us at four in the morning. The first time that we got the entire uh, system together, we, we rigged the rope up over a, a door frame in the hallway in the uh, just outside the lab where we were building this thing and uh, couldn't wait to try it out and just sit on it. Here's a picture of the three of us the first time we pulled 500 pounds with it. And then uh, here I am up at the top over the swimming pool on one of our biggest uh, first tests. So what, what does it take to take a new technology from a rough prototype that has worked the first time in highly controlled circumstances and get it out into the world in a way that it can actually make a difference for people and in a way that will allow new early adopters to be willing to try out something new. I'll tell you from experience, you can show a lot of cool stuff, uh, but if you can't get the organization to actually be willing to try it out, like there's a lot of people that think Batman gadgets are cool. Absolutely, but launch that grappling hook over my transmission tower when it's live with 500,000 volts on it there's a long list of people who will just say, are you kidding me to that? And it has taken a lot of skill building uh, in communication and customer discovery and, uh, and learning on the fly in new situations to learn how to navigate those situations as well. So what does it take to get those new power descenders airworthy on a Coast Guard helicopter as they are now, or ready for a utility to adopt in their, in their transmission services? Um, and what does it take to consistently come up with new, new technology ideas that, that you could take forward into the world in the first place? That's something I wanted to focus on a little bit as well. Okay, so here's a cute little picture. Um, because when I started with thinking about new technologies, <laughs> uh, a sweet scene popped into my head from the movie, uh, A Star is Born. And it, I'll, I'll butcher the quote, but the gist of it here is that the Bradley Cooper's character is, is saying to Lady Gaga how there's, there's really just 12 notes in a scale. You go up those 12 notes and then on the next octave it repeats. And it's really all about how you see those notes and how you put them together. And the same thing popped into my head in thinking about new technology development, um, especially in the early stages. Because you know, thanks to my friend Newton over here, uh, we're all working with the same laws of physics. And for the most part, we're, we're all working with roughly the same tool set of uh, you know, code and machine shops and rapid prototyping. Um, so how do you consistently employ the tools that we have available? Maybe make a couple of special new ones if you need to. Um, and use those to make something that's new and that matters and then get people to actually be able to use it. Well, for me, uh, it starts with noticing stuff. I can't stress this one enough. Um, notice things, internally and externally. There are uh, a number of references to getting in touch with the thing that really motivates you. And if you're not used to introspection, uh, that might be kind of a newer idea. If you're not used to 
paying attention to what you're actually kind of pumped about versus what feels like a total slog. Uh, perhaps that's new. But both for your own internal self-reflection to help figure out what, what you want to be aligned with and uh, noticing what's happening externally to let you get in touch with realms of possibility where you can make a big difference. That is really, really key. I'll give you an example recently. Um, in any career, your experiences can kind of ebb and flow. And obviously, I mean, you, you've seen like since I was a kid, I love making stuff. I'm, I'm standing in my garage, even though I, you know, I run my company um, with the help of good friends. Uh, even if I have to stare at Excel spreadsheets all day and get all the financial statements aligned or um, do a long sales call with a prospective customer, I feel at home here. I'm in my shop because I want to make stuff. And that's, that's what I'm here to do. Um, I've spent my entire life feeling energized by that. But I still get surprised and shocked when I get to notice the, the contrast between how it feels to be doing something that really gives me lots of energy and, um, and the things that, that really don't. So I experienced that recently with that cool uh, project that we got to do with NASA where we were building the, the spacesuit simulators. And I had been going through a, a little phase of focusing on the company, getting the budgets all set, trying to bring in really excellent people to help expand our team. Um, and those things I can do, um, I've learned to do them well, but they don't give me energy. But all of a sudden, when we got this opportunity, I saw an opportunity to make a difference for the, the customer by developing something they could they could do some rougher testing in that were really rugged, more so than a, a typical space suit, at least for the, the kinds of testing we were going to do. It felt like being a kid again to me. I I just, I haven't worked 100-hour weeks in a long time, but I did for a, for a couple of months just because I was so motivated to pull that thing off. And... Um, that's what I mean by noticing. I mean, in this case, it wasn't very subtle. It was slamming me in the face. Like, I need to be building cool new stuff. That's what gives me energy. So uh, it had been a while since I was really engaged in a project like that. And for me, the, that noticing that I'm talking about, like, it smacked me in the face. It can be more subtle as well. But what I encourage you all to do is just pay attention. Every once in a while, notice, how does it feel to be doing the work that I'm currently doing? Do I feel like I would want to do this on a weekend, even if I weren't getting paid? If so, that's probably a pretty good uh, indicator that you're on the right track. That, that The place that you're in when you're working with that kind of self-directed motivation, where you're just feeling like, I, I want to bring this into reality, that's the key indicator that you're in a spot where you can bring your best to the world. It, it doesn't matter so much to me that everybody's an engineer, just like was said in the earlier session, um, or that any particular engineer winds up working with what they uh, originally studied. What matters and where you can bring your best is when you are aligned in your work with what you would want to be doing anyway. It's perhaps more rare than it should be. I know there's there are a lot of us out there and most people that have become engineers do like making things and we almost all get to engage with that in some form or another. But um, just notice the difference between when you're doing something you love and you want to do all the time uh, versus whatever else you might be doing because it could be a good indicator for, for that alignment. And if you find you're not quite aligned, um, there's a lot of good things you can do to help shift toward alignment. Bring yourself. This is another key one. I uh, I feel lucky that in our in our company we've gotten to create a culture that um, naturally winds up <laughs> allowing people to bring themselves. It it's such a different experience being in a work environment where you know for the sake of maintaining an air of professionalism you leave seventy five percent of yourself at the door when you walk in the office. How can you bring your best and your your intrinsic motivation to make something awesome in the world if you are leaving the stuff you're excited about and that you want to share about uh, at the door just so you can maintain this sense of how we think people should act in, in an office space. Um, it, it's not always comfortable to be totally authentic and that's, that's totally understandable as well, but the more we can all notice what we're aligned with and be a little more comfortable bringing that in and be like, hey, I, I'm excited about this or check out XYZ thing I'm interested in. 
being able to bring that full self to work is going to help facilitate you bringing your very best. We have an arm wrestling table at the office, for instance. <laughs> it's a uh, it's kind of an amusing point. We the office can be a little bit quirky, but we if people ever uh, are celebrating something big, arm wrestling breaks out. It's it's a uh, it's fun to compete. It's a little silly, um, but it's fun to just share that we we don't mind having a good time and we don't mind bringing our our outside interests into the office space because uh, in our case some of us were climbers and that helped facilitate some of our early work with um, developing power and climbing equipment uh, so that that's a more direct version of how hobbies and outside interests can be functional in helping develop new technology when you bring that into the office but just again bring that noticing next time you walk in your office um, how much of, I, of myself am i bringing or do i feel comfortable bringing here and um, what might I want to bring that's a little more authentic so I can connect with my colleagues and build more trust and bring more of my own special capabilities to my context. Um, follow the fun. This, this is, I, you can see a pretty consistent look on my face from a lot of these videos that I'm sharing. Um, it's, it's tapping into that same desire to do something cool that you would be doing anyway on weekends, even if it were part of your job. Uh, the the feeling of getting to try out something new for me is what makes me stay up super late into the night so I can get the prints running so I can have the parts in the morning and put this new assembly together and see what happens. This is just a short little video uh, of me with, um, you can see my son Calvin in the background here. <laughs> this is totally whimsical. I just, an idea popped into my head to use a, uh, a shop vac and it's powered Airstream to make a little automatic ping pong ball cannon launcher. Three, two, one. <laughs> one. So anyway, that's uh, <laughs> that little video. It's, it's totally whimsical. It's, it's perhaps almost useless but it does show you the way that I feel and what drives me when I'm bringing in cool, cool new stuff. Um, and, uh, and also I think is a testament to how far you can get with cardboard and duct tape. I cannot recommend those enough for early, early stage prototyping of all kinds. Those are a couple of, of things on kind of the, the bringing yourself into a spot where you can more naturally have the cool ideas that the world really needs and that you want to work on intrinsically. But once you have a cool new idea, it's it can be super challenging to uh, actually get the resources to get it uh, coming into the world. So Natalie brought up a really good point about it doesn't necessarily take that much uh, budget or a tremendous amount of resources to to bring out something new. And I truly believe that's that's the case as well. You, if you've ever been in a really big engineering meeting in a large organization and think about the billing rates that that must be uh, uh, racking up while people debate scope changes, it's uh, it's kind of horrifying how much uh, how many resources can go into time versus actually making stuff. And so I really encourage people to um, think a little more like uh, a hero of mine, MacGyver. I don't know if uh, I know there's a new version of this show on. I grew up watching early episodes in, in the late 80s and 90s. But for those of you who, who haven't watched a lot of MacGyver, he was a big role model for me. He's uh, the place where solving a, a problem with chewing gum in a paper, paper clip, that idea comes from. And not only did uh, he make a big impression on me, I guess watching the show, that was some of the only TV I got to watch as a kid. Um, I, almost as a, as a role model, I guess, what I picked up from, from watching that show was a way of being in the world where everywhere you look is something you can use. Everywhere you look is some kind of resource. Those resources can come in every form, whether it's some chewing gum and a paper clip on your desk, like MacGyver might be solving a problem with, to uh, a neighbor who happens to have special expertise in XYZ thing that you're working on, or a friend of a friend that you might reach out to for help. The world is full of resources. and especially these days um, with the accessibility of really advanced software development packages. And the fact that I can help my kids 
do some reasonably advanced programming to make cool robots work when I have very little coding background myself. I can take these blocks of code and make them work together with minimal technological expertise on that front. It's an incredible time to be making stuff. And so I would much rather choose to be in that mindset of there's resources everywhere for every reason rather than time is tight, the budget's tight, I don't, I, my team is not big enough. Um, the way that your mind works when you're in that space of kind of constraint and, and fear is fundamentally different from the way that your mind works when you are looking around and seeing possibility. You can choose that mindset. You can choose to take on that attitude when you're uh, in a challenging situation. And uh, remembering that can be, can be tricky. It's something that I still have to actively do. It's, I have a lot of good habits of mind around that, but boy, does it still take some, uh, some focus to regain that if I'm in a, a challenging spot. Um, but I sure notice the difference. And I'm sure you will too, if you're doing some of that noticing of, if I'm feeling afraid because stuff isn't going the way I expected, I got thrown nine curveballs in a row and I'm feeling like the president of bad news club calling customers because the extrusion supplier uh, is quoting 12 weeks all of a sudden because of COVID. Um, and we're not going to deliver on time, recent true story, uh, or, uh, you know, the, the mechanism didn't work how we thought. And so this deliverable on this exciting new R and D project has to slide to the right in the schedule a little bit. Um, curveball after curveball after curveball will come your way, especially when you're working on new, on new things where it's a new frontier, um, you know, out of, out of that crazy uncertainty is where all the possibility is, but boy, is there a lot of whiplash when things don't go your way. So uh, I noticed during COVID as probably a lot of you did as well, that at least my own familiarity with surprise, things aren't how you thought they were, uh, is at least being familiar with it felt like it reduced the whiplash a little bit. And while I have have plenty of overwhelming moments, um, at least it's not new. And I know that I can take a couple of deep breaths, rely on that tool set of, of how I deal with uh, surprise adversity and um, find one simple step I can take and then keep moving forward. So choose the mindset of seeing the resources that are everywhere. Um, I also wanna talk some about the things that really make a difference if you have that system and you're trying to get something you out into the world um, and people give you a lot of thumbs up because they think it's cool, but you still can't quite get a contract to get paid for it, or you still can't quite get through regulatory hurdles that might be in the way of, of somebody really picking it up and running with it. Um, it's surprising to me how, how many thumbs up you can get for something that seems really cool, but when it actually times to get it, uh, when it actually comes time to get it approved and, and have some money get, uh, get paid down on the bottom line to either purchase a new technology or fund an R&D project or even adopt a new initiative inside of an existing organization, people kind of clam up. And so these are some of the, the tools that I consistently use and have worked on really hard myself to, to help ease that process of getting a new thing out into the world where people will actually use it. Number one is communications. It's, it was so surprising and uh, it kind of disappointing to me to find as, as an early engineer that things I thought I had communicated clearly were not understood how I thought they were understood and how uh, also people didn't do what they said they were gonna do uh, when they said they were gonna do it. I still remember these shocking experiences of being a, we had an early contract to develop some of our Ascender technology forward. And uh, we had this rough prototype and we had finally landed some funds to, uh, to help make it a, a really feelable solution. So we're on a timeline and we found some really good small partner companies that were um, you know, big enough to be capable, but small enough that our tiny little self-funded startup wasn't, uh, uh, they weren't gonna just ignore us. We were still meaningful to them. And we got them on contract and said, okay, they're gonna build these 12 prototype parts for us and then we'll just integrate all the parts and it should work right. Um, oh boy, 
as I'm sure a lot of you more experienced engineers are probably thinking like, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna put all the pieces together and it's gonna work. But this was our first, our first bigger project out of the gate like that. And not only did we run into those technical surprises that are obviously gonna arise, but people didn't, didn't get them done on time. And sometimes it was for reasons outside of their control, but a lot of times it was because some of these suppliers just weren't prioritizing our work, even though they had made a commitment to deliver on time. And so um, I had to really develop some improved communication skills to get better clarity, to get um, a really good understanding of where they were, where they really were in approaching the project and then learn how to manage those suppliers and make sure that everything was on track. Holy cow. It was just, but, but you said that you were going to do it on time and we were going to pay you to do that. And they didn't. Um, those are the kinds of things that can often sink projects when you were really just planning on working on the technological stuff. If the parts don't get in on time, you, 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 can't, you can't build your cool thing. Um, and so those communication skills are really important. And that goes, it's not just about supplier management. It's, it's about communicating the value of your product to a new uh, prospective client. It's about communicating with your own, the people that you manage or who manage you about expectations. Um, getting comfortable with communications and especially with sharing uh, sharing bad news and sharing it early. Those are critical to being able to, to keep things on track when they're new. How and what? These are, these are the, the two ways that I try to start all my questions with when I'm out with uh, a new customer trying to discover ways that we might be able to be helpful to them. Um, it's, it's just a, I learned this in a workshop I did um, a couple of years ago and it's made a big difference for me because when you are inviting somebody new to try out the cool new thing that you've come up with, you're learning about how that might be useful or important to them. It's really important to ask not just open-ended questions, but questions that can help, help you really understand what's hard for them and how your solution might be able to fit and, and make a difference for them. So my simple rule for doing that that I learned at this workshop was start all your questions with how or what. Some examples might be when we were, this was pretty recent as we began to get into the utility sector. We're coming from a place of have, have a lot of operational expertise in rescue and uh, we're bringing this technology, which is, you know, we had invented it years prior. So I don't know if you could call it new technology uh, in the core sense, but for the utility sector, new technology, absolutely. This is totally different from the typical bucket truck that they're going to be sending up or they're going to be accessing a transmission line with. So we're trying to learn about what's important and, uh, and how we might be able to make a difference for them. And I just framed all my questions with how and what. Um, how do you currently do the operation is a, is, a great, uh, is a great starting example. How do you get up to the transmission line right now? Um, what does that take in terms of resources? Usually by the time you start saying either the how or the what, the rest of the question can formulate itself and they don't all come out perfect, but it's a simple rule that both um, allows them to share more uh, openly on, and authentically about what's important to them and how you can help. And, uh, and it's also just a, a great way to connect with people and, and not accidentally ask them leading questions uh, just because you're excited about what you're doing. Familiarity with discomfort. Uh, this is, has come up um, in, in uh, Natalie's keynote in the, panel, in the panel discussion earlier. When you're out at the forefront of anything, um, there's going to be all kinds of emotions that come up, and it's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be stretched in ways that you didn't expect, uh, whether it's with pressure from a deadline or um, the excitement of getting to pursue something new or feeling overwhelmed because you've got so much stuff on your plate and uh, it's hard to feel where to start. So getting familiar with discomfort is, is key. It, I, I frame it that way instead of just get into your, or sorry, get out of your comfort zone because I think most of us are familiar with what it feels like to be outside of our comfort zone. And for Pete's sake, it's not comfortable, right? <laughs> like we're, it's, uh, it's not necessarily a fun place to be. Um, and I'll say from experience, from having lived on a lot of frontiers at the edge of my own comfort zone, um, 
it stretches your capacity a lot and you can take on more and more, which is exciting, but it is not comfortable. What came to mind for me in thinking about being at the edge of your comfort zone is, is actually a quote from a famous bike racer, Greg Lamond, who says famously, uh, you, it never gets easier, you just get faster uh, in terms of, he's talking about bike racing. And it can feel a little bit like that when you're at the edge of your comfort zone, especially if you're naturally seeking out that edge and putting yourself in new situations to expand your horizons or expand technological horizons. It's not comfortable and it doesn't necessarily get more comfortable. That's the point. But you can develop familiarity with it and you can notice, oh, I'm here again. This is this is one of my edges where I don't like calling people with bad news, but if I don't call them soon, it's gonna derail this project. Time for some personal growth, time to help that engineering career advance a little more. And um, and you can become more familiar with it. And uh, and you can develop some tools to, to help yourself perhaps get a little more comfortable with that area of discomfort. But just know that it's one of the worst, most worthwhile things you can do to advance your own capability and uh, and to advance your career. And also, it's not that comfortable. And you can uh, just give yourself credit for choosing that and being willing to expand your horizons and bring a little kindness to yourself when you are having a hard time because that's always gonna that's always gonna come up. In fact, I made a slide about kindness. It's it's something that I always come back to and that I feel better, I guess, as an adult taking, uh, taking ownership of um, uh, an approach that I choose. Things just, that, that's, that's me. Um, I like to choose kindness and it, it just makes, it changes the, the quality of every kind of interaction. And, you know, where I'm getting to this point of, so much of advancing new technological development really being a lot more about all these other things um, on top of that that core technological nugget. Uh, choosing kindness in all your interactions just makes, it, it changes almost everything. Um, and it's also a, a really important thing to not only choose for other people, but but yourself, right? If you're gonna be pushing your boundaries and outside your comfort zone, also give yourself a little credit and take good care of yourself and be kind to yourself if things are not going the way that you expected. Or if you made a, if you made a choice or a call that in retrospect uh, didn't come out the way you wanted, um, you can still be kind to yourself and recognize that that's just part of growth. It's part of learning. And uh, think of the, the mantra that I always enjoy and usually helps me be a little more kind to myself, um, which is that Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. There's just no way around it. Um, so if you made a bad call, that's all right. We all do. And be kind to yourself as you move on and give yourself a shot to, to make a better call next time. Getting unstuck, just a small tactical thing. Um, I've gotten to do some really cool stuff and some just absolute peak experiences, a lot like what Natalie's talking about. And um, I hope everyone out there has had some experience that they can draw on to, to have a felt sense for what that feels like when you're just, you're living the dream. This is awesome. It is not like that all the time. Far, far from it. I got stuck, I get stuck all the time on all sorts of things. And uh, I, one example, like, okay, this big, this big, wrong side. This big wooden model back here. This is um, we're working on a project to advance some of our, our aircraft hoisting capabilities. We're building a, a tripod high point to redirect the rope so you can get a, a litter and a rescuer up into the aircraft. And so we need to build some kind of a mock-up so we can actually have that hands-on experience. Like designing this thing in CAD is only going to get us so far. Uh, we at some point you, you have to start messing with stuff and make sure that uh, your concepts are going to work. So. I've got this thing designed. I, I built it um, in CAD off of dimensions I found on the internet for this particular aircraft. And I've got, I've got a 3D model in front of me. I know I'm gonna build it out of, out of wood because that's the it's fast for me to work with when I'm working out of my home shop instead of the, our, our big headquarters where all the, all the big CNC machines are. So I'm like, all right, I gotta build this mock-up out of wood. 
I, want, I need to build this shape. I could not for the life of me figure out where to start. This was, this was four days ago. <laughs> I'm staring at this model like I'm a little bit low on sleep. That makes a huge difference, by the way, in terms of your idea flow and idea qualities, but like only a little bit low on sleep, but just stuck, could not figure out where to start. Um, so I, I, I ultimately just did, I remembered to do what's always got me out of the situation, which is to take, take any step, take any step. It didn't matter what step I took. I just needed to take one step. Um, and part of what made it hard to do that initially was, well, once I take a step, I'm going to close off all these other ways that I might be able to do it. I'm going to limit my options. How do I be, well, take one step. I put in, I put in, uh, this two by four right here. I was like, all right, I know how wide the door is. I'm going to put a two by four at the top. That means the two by four has to be 65 inches long. Okay. Now I have a two by four. Now, what do I attach to, to the two by four? And like, so piece by piece, I got myself unstuck. And interestingly, I'm sure that you, you probably have had some similar experiences. The guardrails, the, the constraints of your project, whatever the constraints may be, they can feel like the most frustrating guardrails ever, or they can also help usher things forward just simply because of, of limitations that are in place. It's like, all right, I've got this two by four. Closes off a bunch of other options, but at least now I can start navigating a path. Um, and along the way, you may discover that path is veering in a direction that's not going to work well for the project. But hey, you're moving. Now you can now you can realize that, and you have the chance to course correct. And the project, the net effect of the project, even though you might be meandering a bit, is still advancing forward. Go lightly. This is I, I got to. I try to remind myself of this as much as I possibly can. Um, we can all get so bogged down with pressure and overwhelm, and we're trying to, you know, maintain quarantine and not get sick and not travel and get the kids to school on time and try to be good parents and try to be good spouses or girlfriends or boyfriends or family members. And it's just, there's been so much, especially in this last year, um, try to be, advancing your career at the same time and, and doing well at work. And um, it's so easy to get bogged down and overwhelmed and you know, forget to be kind to yourself. And I just encourage everybody to, to, to hold all the things lightly um, as much as we can. It's, it's, a, it's a broad thing you can actually apply in a lot of different scenarios. One, one is just in your own context, trying to navigate day-to-day -day things and be effective in the world. Um, There's a little, there's an extra little mantra that I try to use that I think ties to that, which is good luck, bad luck, who knows? There's a, it's one of the ways I respond when I get a yet another earth shaking surprise thrown my way because they almost feel, felt daily, at least last year. Um, you just can't tell what the ultimate outcome is of any particular twist or turn that a project or a career, or a, or a life may take. And if you can hold all the things that you're pursuing and, and working on and trying to advance, if you hold them all a little bit lighter, um, when those curveballs do come your way and smack you in the face and throw you on your back, um, it's a it can be a hard thing to feel into, especially if you get uh, a really big one. Like, my gosh, the one that... Uh, we heard about in Natalie's uh, session was that's that's a huge shocker. That's your entire dream getting shifted sideways in a way that you didn't expect. Um, but I certainly find that the more that I can live into that, there's this great, I think it's a it's an old proverb that actually has this wonderful story about good luck, bad luck, who knows where um, uh, one thing after another happens and it just, it flips back and forth between the situation seeming like, oh, that was clearly a good luck thing that happened, but then it causes this other thing that's like really bad. And then because of that, this other thing happens that's like pretty good. And so it's just a, it's a, it's a spot that you can try, try to bring it up and see how it feels next time you get a surprise. Like good luck, bad luck, who knows? Um, and get yourself unstuck and take that next step to keep moving forward. Space. I threw this one in here because uh, not only is it a cool, exciting new frontier, but um, it's important to give yourself space. You're... I've experienced this so, so many times um, 
where the difference between being focused and crunched in on the work, trying to get stuff done, uh, it's a really different state for your, your mind and your system to be in. And it's great to be able to do that, to buckle down, to, to get the thing built once you have you know, the, the basic guardrails set up. Um, but it's a very different mode of operation to be in than, uh, than the bigger, more expansive realm of possibility where you can get bigger new ideas flowing in and solve problems at a different level. That kind of thinking really can only come about when you're giving yourself enough space. And you can do that. Um, it's important to do that at a number of levels. I can hardly tell you the number of like good small breakthrough ideas I've had when I'm just on my way to go filter my coffee uh, at, and just leaving my desk like to get up and, and that short walk to the bathroom. Like the small shift of uh, of context and relaxing from that intense focus allows for a new idea to flow in um, for what I'm working on. That small amount of space makes a huge difference. So give yourself those small spaces, give yourself bigger spaces, uh, take little breaks um, and actual vacation time from work. Allow yourself to unplug. Your mind operates in a really fundamentally different way when you're in that relaxed mode. And um, you know, if you're in, in any way attached to new technology and, and solving cool, big new problems, those are when those really big, exciting ideas can flow in. Uh, they can pave the way to really big transformations. And then just last, I wanted to share passing it on. Um, all of us are the products of mentorship and support and people believing in us and sharing new ideas and what they think is cool and getting us inspired to follow our own path. Pass that on. Make sure that you're passing it on. There's just, a, you know, it's an accelerating amount of, of big challenges that face us. And um, I, too, am really optimistic because when I look at uh, what the incredible tool sets are that our next generation will have access to, it's just, it's staggering. It's mind-blowing to me what uh, what's currently available and what will become available. But... Um, Make sure that you're also passing on your your values and approaches about how you deal with adversity and uh, and pass on ways of being in the world that allow them to, uh, the next generation to uh, get in touch with with what gets them energized to do the fun stuff in their daily lives that um, that will help advance the the world in the way that we need it. I feel lucky that I've gotten to do that a lot through live events and through um, getting to do some kids book series and and the show that I've had so much fun. We've even filmed a couple episodes here, Designs by Global. Um, and all of these things, it's uh, perhaps the, the very most exciting to me is now that my, my kids are old enough to start enjoying making things too. Um, a, I get to relive or live for the first time myself all of the, the, the fear that my parents must have experienced when they're like, Oh, that's, are you old enough to use that hot glue gun or hey, no power tools until you're 12 years old, Nathan? Um, uh, it's, it's a great little uh, comeuppance for me, I guess, as a parent, but it's so fulfilling to pass on what I've learned and to get to see those little nuggets of ideas begin to build into new capabilities in them. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure and a, and a privilege to get to be involved in that in, in, any young person's life, much less uh, my own kids. It's something I feel grateful for. Um, I just want to encourage everybody that's that's engaged in outreach out there, not only to focus on those hard skills, because those are critical, but all the additional values that, that keep you tied to your purpose, uh, that that really drive the, the true game-changing new technologies uh, that we're all here to bring into the world. So with that, uh, I just want to encourage everybody to make cool stuff. Do it your way. Stick with what you find calls you to show back up every day, um, especially the kinds of things that you would be doing even if you didn't get paid. And enjoy the process, because what is it if it's uh, if we can't have fun while we're making the world a better place? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So, um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm I'm one of your uh, IEEE USA Evo 21 hosts. So, before we move on to the Q and A, uh, we're going to open up the um, 
floor for audience questions. Uh, before we move on, Nate, I'd just like to say, I think um, a lot of the stuff that, a lot of the lessons, those key talking points you mentioned, uh, really are relevant to um, just people in the professional uh, world overall. I know, uh, I think you mentioned earlier how um, there was a difference, there, there was um, you being good at your job, but then there's something next level about doing something that you really love, being really passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, I did notice that uh, one of our audience members did mention the same thing that he uh, related to uh, what you mentioned. Um, he um, he mentioned that how that he works at a uh, hackathons every weekend. Um, nice. And you know, um, uh, he's that's something he's really passionate about. Um, I think I, I feel like this is most people's um, dreams to find something that they really enjoy and being able to work on that kind of stuff. Uh, finding the right balance between that is all obviously the hard part. Um, but yeah, uh, so let's move on to the questions. So one of our questions, um, let's see. So one of our audience members asks, how do you keep setbacks and failures from dampening your enthusiasm or dropping a pursuit, especially if others are approaching you with a negative attitude about continuing to move forward? Hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> that can be tough. Um, boy, especially when you're working on something new and it's it's not so much of a, a, a set path between point A and point B. Uh, set, setbacks and failures happen so much. One, um, when I mentioned kind of holding things lightly, I find that that really helps. Uh, it's It's a bit of a I don't know if it's a paradox or balance, but on the one hand, you've got a cool new thing that you're really excited about and you're trying to push hard and then you've, you've um, believe in its capacity to make a difference in the world and you're super motivated. And, and then on the other hand, uh, I fall into the trap as often as anybody where I'm super pumped about a cool idea. I think it's awesome. Maybe it's not actually a really awesome idea. <laughs> um, I find that the more, the more I cling to my belief that an idea has has a lot of potential and value, the harder it is to to absorb and deal with and move on from the big failures and setbacks. Granted, like if you if you feel really passionate about something, um, yeah, you can spend years and and so much of your of your life's resources invested in that. It can feel really brutal to get shot down really hard. So holding it lightly. Um, at the same time as recognizing its real value, it, it's a balance and a paradox. I, I wish I could speak to the way that I'm feeling about it better. Um, but the other is, is this little mantra of like, good luck, bad luck, who knows? Uh, re recent little example. Um, project got derailed a bit due to a technological surprise that we didn't anticipate. It's a complicated system, a new unknown interaction between subsystems arose, project got delayed, um, felt super frustrating, told myself that I should have managed it differently, should have done X, Y, Z, all those things totally come up. That's absolutely normal. We all have those experiences. Um, and, you know, pretty big setback, felt like a big schedule failure. Uh, there are a number of things that we did to, to help deal with that. But for my own self to hold it a little more lightly and not get so so uh, bound up in that setback. It's like, I was trying to think like, good luck, bad luck, who knows? Um, there's this fun concept that I like to think of sometimes called the non-toothache, where most of us right now are not currently appreciating that we don't have a toothache, right? My mouth is feeling fine. Heck yeah. <laughs> um, when you do have a toothache, it's killing you. It is omnipresent. It is a major part of your experience at all times. Right now, I don't have a toothache. Like, rock on. That's a little bit of a, a spin on that good luck, bad luck, who knows. But if I have a major setback, I try to bring in that good luck, bad luck, who knows, because I don't know the downstream headaches that I might have avoided by not shipping that thing. Like, thank goodness that that technological surprise revealed itself before that system was out with a customer. And they had that surprise happen um, with higher stakes. So a lot of it, uh, one of the one of the useful tools I also use is is just 
contextualizing what's happening and um, and the bad outcomes I may have avoided with that seemingly uh, damaging setback in that moment. Um, and just if others are approaching with a negative attitude, continue to move forward. I find this is something that I struggle with all the time. Um, I I enjoy performing. I've developed a lifetime of of capability in, in tracking how an audience is responding and how other people are responding to what I'm up to. If I'm getting negative feedback, um, it certainly hits me harder than perhaps it hits other people. And I find the more in touch I am with my own reason for doing something, um, my own intrinsic motivation to be pushing on that. If I feel really clear that this is the right thing for me to be doing and I'm like, I would be doing this on weekends or staying up late at night because I want to, it's way easier to allow that negative feedback to, to flow off of me. So um, get in touch with with what's here for you. And, and that's a key thing to help uh, help buffer the, that outside negative attitude stuff. Absolutely, great answer. I feel like uh, this is something that a lot of people or everyone needs to think about. Um, I think setbacks are setbacks are going to happen no matter what you do. Uh, I feel like it's a matter of changing your mentality, having a positive mindset on things that really helps towards like positive uh, growth, whether it be professional, personal, any kind of growth. So great answer. Um, so we'll ha we have time for one more question. So this last question, you mentioned the pandemic exposing the vul vulnerability of the global supply chain. How can tech help to make the supply chain more resilient? Whoa, um, that's a good question. I'll just outright. I'm I'm not often thinking at that level, uh, although I am very much subject to it. Uh, like I like I had for my little anecdote about the extrusions. Hmm. Uh, I think there are many many. No it's a complex system, like super complex system. Many 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 nodes uh, in between. Uh, digging ore out of the ground and delivering refined aluminum in the right shape to the, to the end user. Uh, I heard an interesting anecdote recently that part of what has derailed the system uh, most recently is people shifting so hard over to just-in-time manufacturing or, or lean approaches where, um, in, in essence, you don't just buy a whole bunch of stock. You pull a little bit of of material in when you need it, you build it into the thing and you ship it. And it can be awesome because uh, you don't sink as much cash into inventory and it kind of can smooth everything out. That is so true. Uh, it has revolutionized a lot of American manufacturing and global manufacturing. However, it places a huge emphasis on the continued function of that entire complicated system. Um, nobody had inventory anymore. So all what little inventory everybody had got exhausted and now the whole supply chain is broken and it can't you can't ramp up the upstream systems enough to replenish the forward buffers fast enough to make uh, an improvement for the end user so i i think um i i i trust at a high level in the self-organizing principles of complex systems that are well thought out in this case it seems like a good indicator that each, at least each of the nodes in that system needs to rethink um, what their what their resilience uh, capability needs to look like in terms of the potential exposure levels because basically nobody planned for this. So mm -hmm. it in effect it's a long, frustrating, slow, costly feedback loop that we currently just got a bad outcome from. So we're all going back around the circle, being like, "All right, we clearly didn't anticipate the depth of challenge we could face given how we set ourselves up for our, our supply chain needs. So how big do we want to draw the box uh, to define our, our resilience moving ahead? Um, and effectively, how much more inventory do we want to buy in the future once we can get stuff again to help make sure this doesn't happen again in the same way? Mm -hmm. um, that's, 
a good question. I could speculate more, but that's the best I got right now. I hope yeah, no, I have plenty of time to answer that. Uh, <laughs> but great answer anyway. So Nate, thank you so much. Um, we, we're absolutely thrilled to have you join us and to close off our EVA on Campus 1.0 event. Uh, we hope our audience was able to enjoy our first EVO 21 event as well. We can uh, definitely see from the engagement that uh, they definitely did. So before we yeah. end today's live, yeah, no, uh, thank you so much, Nate. Before we end today's live stream, our IEEE USA Director of Communications on IT, John Yaglinski, has some closing remarks for everyone. So um, thanks again, mate, Nate. Yeah, thanks very much, Nate. Uh, that concludes what's been an absolutely amazing day filled with inspirational speakers. We want to thank you, the audience, for attending and thank our amazing guests we've had today, Natalie Panic, Paige Castellan, Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield, Amy Peck, and of course, Nate Ball there. Uh, we also want to thank the folks at Mercer for sponsoring the event. Check out all they have to offer at their site. Uh, and also all the IEEE partners who help us promote the event. Thanks to all of you as well. We hope you'll join us for the next EVO event, EVO Pro, which takes place on September 1st. We've got an exciting announcement to make here today. Joining us will be renowned speaker Ashley Stahl. She's a counterterrorism professional turned career coach who has a monthly column in Forbes and has been featured in Wall Street Journal, CBS, Self, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, and more. You can sign up for Evo Pro and our next Evo on Campus event on November 3rd right now at evoconference.org. And follow along with us on social media. Uh, check out all of IEEE USA social media accounts, be it Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, or LinkedIn. Finally, if you are not a member and you're considering joining, please check out IEEE at IEEEUSA.org slash discover. We've got more information there about the benefits of membership, and we do invite you to visit that page. And finally, I'd like to spotlight the people who help bring this conference to you, the IEEE USA communication staff, including Jonathan Cho, Corey Ruth, Greg Hill, Marnie James, and Georgia Stelludo, as well as our volunteers on the IEEE USA Communications Committee, led by our chair, Rob Weiss, and Communications VP, Brendan Godfrey, and also IEEE USA staff member, David Imes. Until next time, I'm John Yaglinski. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you in September. Bye now.